Uh, so guys, yeah, welcome to another episode of 40 and Fit. My name is John Baruch. I will be the lead singer of the group today. Um, yeah, right? I took that. I thought about that one really hard. I really wanted to throw that one out there. To my right, we got Dave Kalari, lead guitarist. And that's about it. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take <laughs> and then we got just the guy that swings his, his beard around Mike <laughs> to my left. Uh, today's guest is a very special guest. Um, pretty strong name in the in the fitness industry. Uh, we've all been looking looking through his stuff a lot lately. Um, Mr. Paul Carter, thank you, thank you for showing up, Mr. Paul. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Let's uh, let's get after this. Yeah, not a problem. So my first question before we go into some deep deep dive uh, stuff, lift, run, bang. Where where did that come from? <laughs> that um, when I was trying to come up with a name for uh, when I was writing my when I had a blog. So kind of how I got started out. I got discovered was actually was writing articles um, on my blog. And I started, when I first started writing, I wanted to actually call it function, like it was like functional strength something. And because my idea at the time was to take the whole stupid functional strength, like balancing yourself on medicine balls or BOSU balls while you throw rocks through the air, at like <laughs> crocodiles or whatever, like whatever you're doing, you know, that was more functional was to take it and redefine it and actually just say, Hey, it meant something totally different. Like it actually just meant getting stronger with barbells and dumbbells and stuff in the gym. And that was functional. And then I thought, wow, that's really stupid. So I decided not to use that. And I went with uh lift run bang because at the time, um, that's what I was doing, um, just lifting and running. That, but the bang, everybody always thinks it's like a, like, a, uh, like a sexual thing, and it's really not. So the bang part is actually, I, I was a computer programmer for 15 years, well, computer engineer for Unix systems. And um, the bang part is what we call in programming would be a variable. So in programming, a variable would be, um, you would write the variable in a program and say whatever word you wanted to. And it could mean, anything in that program that like a command line that you needed that bear to be. So lift, run. So the bang part would be bang, boom. What is it you're doing in life outside of your, your training, your conditioning, you know, so lift, run. And, you know, like, I guess some of us play music. So lift, run and music, or if you're an MMA guy, lift, run and MMA or lift, run and football or from, and it could be art or whatever it is because life should be more about than just like, picking stuff off and putting it down and doing some conditioning and packing meal prep and all that kind of stuff. So the bang was the variable in there for each individual person and their own N equals one thing that kind of get their heart rate going and gives life a deeper sense of meaning and purpose to them. Wow. Wow. That was a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be. I'll be honest right. with so, you. Yeah, it had, it had, I liked it because most people immediately when you say lift from bang, they laugh, but they don't forget it. But then when they ask me to explain it, that's usually the reaction. Like, that's really cool. So I stayed with it for that reason. And, I, and most people usually do remember it. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's why I had to ask what it meant, because I did right. go to that sexual point of view, to be honest oh. with you. And I was like, OK, yeah, well, we'll definitely remember this, especially if it was a good story. Um, so that was a good story. Um, <laughs> So <clears throat> I don't know if you know much about how, why we started this podcast. Um, so just a, just a little background. We're all in our in our early 40s right now. And um, the whole concept is that we've realized that, you know, certain guys at a certain point of our lives, uh, some of us would say we're going through a midlife crisis. I personally feel like I was going through or still am going through a midlife crisis. And I wasn't sure what it was in the last three to five years. So I started asking the question out loud, how many other guys are going through certain things, depressions, questioning life, you know, like not life's meetings, but stuff that you're going through. And, um, and, and are you making the right decisions? And have I, you know, do I care about my family anymore? Stuff like that. And I realized that it was, it started when I was about 37 and, um, and here we are, we're at, I'm at 42 now and I'm, I'm still questioning a lot of things that's going on. Uh, we've been in the fitness industry between all of us uh, over 20 years each. And I always ask the question also, cause I have kids. When I see a lot of my kids, uh, their friends, parents, and I see that they're the same age as, as we are, I'm like, wow, they, they look 10, 20 years older than what I look like. But why am I going through a depression? And why do I feel weird about myself? Why, do, why is that all these weird things are happening? Um, and so I felt like 
no one talks about this enough. And, and you know, and I, and I reached out to Dave. Dave is someone that I've known for, for two decades now. I was like, let's just start talking about this stuff. And, you know, Mike came along and Mike, we, we just clicked. And so I decided to just throw this thing out there. We wanted to start this podcast. So one of the, the first questions we usually ask everyone that comes on here is, based on your age, have you gone through some sort of midlife crisis or some something along those lines? Not necessarily in the means of, you went out and bought a Corvette. You know, everyone uses that. that term. So I was going to, I was going to, I actually had to explain that to my fiance. I said, um, cause I'm a car guy and I said, uh, Corvettes are midlife crisis cars. And, um, so anytime I was like, just, she, she really likes cars now too. She's, um, she's gotten into the whole car thing and the Corvette thing. I said, anytime you see somebody in Corvette, watch over and look and see if it's not a dude that's, you know, probably got gray hair and looks older. And I always laugh and say Corvettes are midlife crisis car. I've never owned a Corvette. So when you were talking about potentially feeling like you were going to a midlife crisis, I was going to ask you, have you bought your Corvette yet? No. <laughs> nope. Haven't spent any money. I'll be honest with you. Just on a podcast. Yeah. Just literally bought mics that we're not obviously using for this podcast. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I haven't. Uh, it's just weird questions, weird emotions that I've gone through. Like I said, periods of, of depression, questioning things, and if I've done things right. Is that, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure, you know, Vinny Galanti, he was, he was uh, our second? Yeah. Our second interview on this podcast. And the, the one thing that he threw out there, he's like, get your numbers checked. He's like, figure out your numbers. Because he felt like he went through certain things also. Uh, and, he, and he realized it was his, his, his numbers, testosterone, you know, all his blood. You know, just want to know what, 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 what's underlying in my going through a hormonal situation. Lo and behold, I got my numbers checked. I'm fine. <laughs> I think it's an emotional thing or a mental thing at this point. So I don't know. So yeah, I pose the question to you. Why, why, have you ever gone through those types of things in the past? And if you did, what'd you, what'd you do to get through it? Or are you still going through it? Do you need our help? Do you need a hug? What do you need? <laughs> um, I went through, uh, well, this will be one not pack. So I don't, I don't know that um, you could say that I ever, I don't, I never felt like I went through a midlife crisis. And I guess it's, it all depends on how you kind of define that. And I, I think some people think of that in certain ways as like, it's a negative connotation. And I think there's other ways you can look at it into potentially mature, like maturation into what I would consider real, um, like manhood. And there's actually um, some research that has been verified on a multitude of occasions where the they believe that men don't actually emotionally mature until about 43. So you got about a year left to go because you're sitting 42. You're right on it. Yeah, I'm on it. He's, uh, it's happening for him right now as we speak. And I'm the biggest child in the room. <laughs> so, and, and I honestly, I've had that conversation with lots of my friends. There's definitely some things um, I've talked to my fiance about that. Her and I actually have a really big age gap. So um, somebody would go, well, there's some like crisis thing. I dated women of all ages for the past couple of years. And I could not find any relation to any specific emotional maturity to do with age. I, I, I've consistently found that emotional maturity has relationships to uh, specific um, things that we've lived through in life and areas of our lives that we, we have either survived or persevered or thrived through, things that we've grown through experiences and then there's in areas in all of our lives where we're going to be less emotionally mature because uh, we've never uh, been indoctrinated through those particular experiences or because um, that we simply um, didn't have the coping mechanisms uh, to get through them in a, in a way that allowed us to grow through those particular trials and tribulations. Um, but getting back to that is um, I expressed to, uh, to her that uh, that. The whole going through, I think, what some of us consider like as a midlife crisis as it coming circling back around to that is either like an awakening or a self-awareness. I think it starts coming into you. It's like, what is the legacy I want to live behind as a man? Is, is, am I living every day in a way that I can wake up and I feel like I'm, I'm actually uh, I'm living in a very honorable way? I'm living in a very um, in a way that I'm just proud of as a person. And I went through that after my divorce and I don't, my divorce happened when I was like 39 and 40. And um, I lost all my, basically lost all my kids during that time. They weren't taken away from me or anything like that, but they didn't want to have anything to do with me for a few years. 
And during those few years, I really dedicated myself to a lot of personal development and therapy. And um, like I did tons of relationship courses and I spent, I don't know how long, really doing some deep diving into some unhealthy coping, coping mechanisms that I had had uh, in my life, both in my marriage and that I'd had as a father. And over losing those relationships with my girls more than anything in the world, I wanted to be a great father. I wanted to develop um, a really healthy, loving, close, nurturing relationship with my three girls. And I have the best relationship to this day I've ever had with all three of them. So, but if I wouldn't, um, if I wouldn't have gone through that time with them where they didn't want to spend time with me, where they didn't want to see me, um, where they were hurt about a lot of things that happened, if I wouldn't have had that sense of self-awareness of this is not the, when I, the person that I wake up every day to, um, I'm ashamed of the things I've done. I have regret about things I've done. I want to grow into a much different person. I want to have a, a much closer, loving, nurturing relationship with my girls. Well, the person that was existing every day inside of this body was had not cultivated that. And I didn't have the tools that I needed to cultivate that with my kids. So over the course of those years, um, I was very fortunate. Thank God for my youngest who uh, hung in there with me. Like she, she didn't want to come over and stay with me a lot, and but she, but she would, and we got through things together. We had a lot of hard, tough conversations, and um, through that relationship, getting better, my other two saw her kind of blossom um, and things were between us, and they softened kind of through seeing how happy that she became in the newfound relationship that her and I developed together. And then over the course of the years following that, um, my other two softened a bit and we had some really hard conversations with them too. And now I just have an absolutely, I wake up to an amazing relationship to that I have like my oldest uh, with John Meadows passing me this past week. She texts me probably every other day checking on how I was doing. Um, and so did my middle daughter um, my oldest actually just texted me this morning to ask how I was and wanted to know if I wanted to get lunch next week so she could check on me. So she went three years without talking to me. She actually got married. And I didn't even get to attend the wedding. And we went all the way from that to this. So I remember I went through, I was going through stuff with a relationship coach um, over a year ago. And we were, we were talking about this. And he said, I don't know if you know this, but he said, it's incredibly difficult to repair and mend. Uh, broken relationships with your kids, just one. He said, but doing it with three like that is absolutely almost miraculous. So that's pretty much been my most proud life achievement as a man to this point is to be able to go back and have like basically have like a reclamation uh, with all my girls in that kind of way. So what you were talking about, I don't think there's uh, anything when you're going through that soul searching process that's should have a negative connotation with it of waking up and saying, where's my place in this world? And, you know, what's the legacy I want to leave behind? And what's going to give my life meaning? What gives life meaning to me? Am I waking up every day and living a life that I feel like is honorable to me and the people I love and care about and asking all those hard questions? I don't think that's necessarily called a midlife crisis. I think that's an awakening to trying to become a much better man that exists inside of you. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. Oh. Well, that's a totally different spin on what, you know, no, no one's ever actually put it in that point of view, to be honest with you. Well, he's got a point because yeah. I'm in a newer relationship and we've had a lot of great conversations about <clears throat> something I may say or something she may say that kind of brings up something for one of us. And then we kind of sit down and we put all the stuff on the table and what the feelings mean and whatever things behind it. And she'll go like, how did you figure out like how to do this stuff? And I said, well, from past relationships, when they end, you know, if you're either fighting with somebody or whatever, you kind of have like an exit interview and sometimes certain things re are recurring themes. And you're like, well, how do I want to do this better next time? And you just work on trying to be either a better communicator, better listener, just seeing things from other perspectives. So it's like, if you want to be better, you have to learn how to do those certain things better. It's not like Paul says, like you said, it's not a, always just, oh my God, what, where am I going wrong? It's just like, well, where can you do things just a little bit better? Yeah, but unless you're, unless it's a learned thing, process to think that way, right? Because I, I mean, I didn't, again, I didn't think that way. I, therefore, it was never put in me to think that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I just never 
And so you said it now. Well, okay. that's, that's a good way to think about it then. <laughs> yeah. So that, that well, that's something, and that's another thing that when I was going through therapy and work with people is what are the stories that we tell ourselves each day? They're about who we are, about the circumstances that we're in. And that is such a, a um, such a strong and powerful driving force in our life is what is it that's going on between our observing brain and our thinking brain? And so you have those two brains that work sometimes with each other, but sometimes against each other. And so whatever story it is that you're waking up and you're telling yourself either about your feelings. So immediately what I think, and when you tell me that, it's like you have almost a negative story about some of the things that you're sorting through in your head is like, I'm not a good enough man. Uh, I'm not better, good enough in this way. I'm struggling in this area is when it could be something like, wow, these, these new feelings that I'm, that are coming up in my life are giving me some, uh, giving me a newfound uh, perspective about some areas in my life that, that I can grow into and I can be better. And I'm really thankful. And I um, have so much uh, gratitude that I can wake up and kind of feel that sense of um, direction in my life. Um, because these feelings are clearly, I'm growing out of where I was, which was a, a very, either it could be a dysfunctional place, it could be a toxic place, it can be a place where you're having repeated patterns um, from old wounds that happened either growing up as a kid or past relationships that failed or anything like that. And that can be a, a great way, the story you can be telling yourself can always be something that I'm really thankful that I'm waking up to some of these feelings that that almost feel burdensome, like, because what it's telling me is, is that it's time for me to grow and expand out of some of these places that I've been that have caused me to repeat some of these dysfunctional patterns in my life. Yeah, that's 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 it's a great point of view. It's a great way to start thinking about everything uh, in, in latter part of my life. And that, they're like, really think about these things all over again. Yeah, it's more about <laughs> asking, it's more about asking, like, why do I feel this way as opposed to, like, how can I stop feeling this way? I think that's one of the big things. Because once you know the why, then you know how to get back to whatever you want to get to. Right. 100%, 100%. And, and just give your, yourself permission. Uh, and that's a big one right there is in, in yeah. stating, I said, instead of stating that uh, I want to stop feeling this way, explore the reasons why you do feel that way. And that will end up helping to serve you. It's like, oh, I feel this way because of these reasons. Um, and there's just some places in my life I need to get some healing from, or these are some places in my life I need to grow out of. And that's how we do get better. That's how we do have that maturation process into what I'd consider like manhood. It's really funny because we don't reach that until our early to mid forties. Um, so we go through the rest of our life and we tend to look back. It's hard to say this to guys in their twenties, but when you're, when you're in your twenties, you're kind of a dog shit human being for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like there it is right there. So in your twenties and thirties, you really are. Um, you look, tend to look back after you get to your forties and you really start to, I think, do what you're talking about there and had this coming in your own of like, man, I just want to wake up every day and feel like a really honorable, good man. Like you really crave that. And I think one huge step into doing that, stepping into those places is learning how to forgive yourself for being that dog shit 20 and 30 something year old that you were during those years. And um, Danielle and I haven't had that talk many times when we got joked. I was like, I'm like, you're more than welcome to get out there and date Josh from Best Buy, who's in his 20s or 30s, that's, you know, going to be liking every thought picture all over social media and sliding into DMs all day long, because that's what fucking dudes in their 20s and 30s pretty much spend their time right. doing. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's not really until you get to be in your 40s. I kind of matured out of that early, but I, I still say it's not till you get to be in your 40s that you just go, man, I just really want an amazing woman in my life and I want to be an amazing man to her. And then you kind of get out of that kind of shitty repeated cycle of needing quote unquote either chase women or some guys go through the whole sexual conquest thing you know or whatever i mean you just end up having you realize later some really shitty conversations and some shitty beliefs um about how to navigate your way through life in your 20s and 30s and you spend your early 40s going wow that was really fucked up and then <laughs> you start kind of finding your way out and then that's where i think when the people do these interviews and do these um social psychology studies that they find that men it's not until after about 43 that they kind of stop doing that shit and right. they kind of get their life together. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to like other people, other couples who are, ha have like some uh, some age differences in their relationship and other girls. And they would be like, I girls would be like, I got so I was already so fed up in my 20s with, with douchebags that were in their, their 20s that I realized that guys who actually had their life together were generally going to be in their early 40s. Wow. There's, there goes the stereotype type of stuff <laughs> that you see in the movies that kind of makes sense now that uh, as to where they where that happens. Um, so let's, 
I appreciate that whole point of view. You, you made Leonard, you're definitely making me think uh, from another point of view, because again, that was never brought up really uh, along those lines. Um, well, I want to shift into to the fitness aspect of things. You know, how'd you get your start in in the industry? Um, number one, like even in writing, like like because uh, you know we've all seen your articles, we've seen a bunch of those, those things that you've written. What is your your history with with fitness? Because ours is we we have a very simple one. We all started in the same company together, literally 20, 1998, basically ninety nine. And uh, for some reason, we've all circled back. We're all in the same building again. But <laughs> um, 20, 24 years later. So how did you get started in the, in the industry? Um, starting out, were you bodybuilding or were you were you reading certain magazines back in the day? You know, um, if you go, if you like going back to how like the whole way I got started was uh, like just lifting weights was I was living out in Oregon for a summer with uh, my martial arts instructors, um, parents. And uh, he made me lift uh, every day with him. He had the shittiest training split that I've ever used to this day. It was so ridiculous. <laughs> Is um, He would wake me up in the morning. And I didn't know we were going to do all this when I went out there for summer. But he'd wake me up in the morning. And we'd do chest in the morning. And then go to lunch. And then go back to the gym after lunch and be back. So it was kind of like Arnold's split. Remember Arnold had that, yeah. <laughs> that supposed shitty split that he did when he was competing where he would do, he would do like chest and back together. And, but it's like, sometimes it was like two a days and stuff like that. And so it was basically the same split. So it was like chest in the morning and then we'd go to lunch and then we'd do back after that. It was like the dumbest thing I've ever done in my entire life. The only <laughs> thing number was that Leo Costa Bulgarian power burst split training that oh, he yeah. did with Tom Platts. I don't know if you guys remember that. That was the, that was oh, yeah. training three times a day. Tom Platt, yeah. Yeah. Fuck those guys. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some real dumb people don't know if you live through the the 90s, late 90s, late 80s yep. and early 90s of bodybuilding, there was some dumb shit that came out. Uh, so uh, I did cyber like drinks and everything. Um, so uh, how I got started was like was that we do chest in the morning, eat lunch, do back and then we do uh, martial arts stuff all day. And then the next day would be like shoulders in the morning and then lunch and then arms in the afternoon. <laughs> so and then it would be like the next day would be like uh quads in the morning and then lunch and then like hamstrings in the afternoon so it was the most it was the dumbest training i ever did so you can imagine you know when you first start lifting how sore that you are just from like training sessions like it's not you don't you know you haven't learned how to enjoy soreness it doesn't feel good well, this was debilitating like i would wake up <laughs> in the morning and be paralyzed right like, just not move like they would him and his mom would have to help me over into that they were his parents were really rich and they would have to help me into like the, the whirlpool and turn the whirlpool on. I get in the whirlpool and have to sit just so I could like the, I get enough blood going through the muscles so that way just I could start moving. Yeah. yeah. And so he had this big giant Toyota step side truck. So I had to pull myself up into that thing. Um, I'm like four, I think I was 14 years old at the time. And, um, and then I would get kicked and hit the rest of the day for like six <laughs> hours. So what's funny was, is like, we were, I was in the kitchen with his mother one day. And she was like roughhousing with me. His mom was really cool. And I remember I, I literally flexed. I flexed on her and I saw like my bicep. And I had never, I didn't know I had muscles. I didn't know that I thought I was different than like other boys or something. And I, I actually saw I had a muscle. And I can still remember that I've talked about this in a million podcasts to this day. Like that was more like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I like this. I'm going to do this weightlifting thing forever. And um, so that was what got me hooked. And then as far as getting discovered in the industry, I didn't want to be. Uh, hmm. I was, um, I was friend. Everybody know who Jim Windler is. Mm -hmm. So Jim wrote, he does. So Jim was the senior editor at elite FTS. You guys have all oh, heard of it. Yeah. Him. We know elite FTS. Yep. So Jim wrote five, three, one. So oh. Jim and I were, we, we corresponded every day during this time. And I had, uh, I'd already written a novel a year or so earlier prior to this and I realized I really loved writing but I really love writing more than anything and I was writing my own little articles on my blog and Jim wanted to see them he asked what I was doing every day and he wanted to see them and I, I was like no nah, man it's just for me it's just my stuff I, was, I like writing so I write these little articles and because I grew up reading every bodybuilding magazine flex muscle and fitness uh muscular development muscle media 2000 muscle mag like every every bodybuilding magazine there was I had a subscription to so I was writing my own little bodybuilding and powerlifting articles at the time and Jim read them he's like dude this is the best stuff I've ever like I'm reading right now. and he asked if they could publish my work on at the website 
And I was like, no. And to this day, I think it's funny because people out there are willing to do just about anything to get some visibility oh, dude, or get discovered. And I was having it like thrown at me and I was like, no, I don't want it. And um, so eventually Jim talked me into it and the article like exploded. And then Jim came right back to me and Dave, as said, Dave Tate was like, can you write like six more articles for us? And so I was like, it was really nerve wracking at the time because uh, when you put yourself out there, you write an article like that and you, you're, you're just putting yourself in the public eye. You watch, I mean, social media and the internet can be absolutely brutal in terms of mm -hmm. uh, people displaying their internal dysfunction. So um, it can be, it can be very, uh, it can be nerve wracking. So it would make me nervous. I'd write the article. I'd go over it, like ponder over every word for like a day or two and then send it in. And then it would do really well. And that actually lasted for a long time. So a lot of people don't understand some of those fears that you got to overcome in those circumstances about really putting yourself out there. And, um, from there, just everything grew to the point that um, I was writing, uh, I started writing more like training books and more articles and T Nation contacted me and bodybuilding.com contacted me and I ended up doing uh, seminars and I was competing in powerlifting. My first uh, probably 20 years of lifting was all bodybuilding stuff. And that was my first love. And I got off and over into powerlifting later, which is still probably my own, my single biggest regret about lifting weights ever. I think powerlifting is the dumbest shit on the face of the absolute planet. Um, <laughs> and I, I could never sit here and talk in a disparaging way long enough about the, the entire powerlifting, whatever. And wow. I, if, yeah, if I could do it all over again, that would have been the only thing I would have flushed down the toilet. I think, I think barbell pure strength training is about as bad as a selection as it can get for the majority of people. And the power with being um, getting sucked into that, the whole ideology as a whole does a pretty bad number on, I'd say, the majority of people who start to live super vicariously through on nothing more than I'm only worth um, the whatever pounds on the bar I can lift at this time in my life. Right. And I, I went through that and I saw lots of guys go through that. Um, I also think barbell training is self training with barbell. I basically never use barbell. Um, I don't program almost any barbell lifts. And um, barbell lifts. Um, one of the articles I wrote for uh, for Chess Magazine was basically the, all the reasons why barbells suck uh, for building hypertrophy, and they really do. Like um, they come with so many horrible limitations. They tend to beat people up, lock you into specific uh, joint movement patterns. Um, they don't tend to stress the muscle over uh, very good resistance profiles. They tend to require a lot of balance, coordination, and internal. In internal stability, which makes them poor hypertrophy movement selection. So the belief that uh, the other ones that they they basically people will go, oh man, well this hits a you have whole body movement, whatever. I'm like that's exactly why it's a shitty fucking movement for for muscle mass is when something hits everything, you're not really stressing any one thing in particular. That's exactly a shitty fucking hypertrophy movement. So why would I choose? a movement that hits 27 different muscles when I can choose a movement that hits one area that I'm trying to grow and then pick a few really good select ones like that and get really big without beating myself to shit. That seems like a much better option. So if there was any one thing I could do over again, we've never gotten involved in powerlifting. Now, fast forward through that, uh, I got out of retired from uh, powerlifting and uh, got back into getting in shape because I said, fitting for this podcast, after I turned 40, I was going to retire from powerlifting and get off all the drugs and um, and actually get my fat ass in shape because I was about 290 pounds. And that's what I did. And then as I started uh, getting in shape, uh, because, you know, John Meadows, when I've been one of my best friends for like the last 10 years, John had a very grandma Molly way that he could talk to me to do shit that you didn't want to do, but mm -hmm. very loving when he would say it. And if any of you have ever even spoken five minutes with John, you'd know what I'm talking about. So he was like, you're looking pretty good, man. You should you know, you should think about doing a show. And he could say it like that and go like, yeah, man, I think I should. And then I remember I was about three weeks out from contest prep and I was driving somewhere and I was so depleted. Uh, I didn't know where I was driving anymore. And I, blew up <laughs> lot. And I said, man, fuck John Meadows. And that's, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much. So I ended up, yeah. So I ended up getting back into that. And then over the last many years since then, uh, developed a much bigger love for functional anatomy and good biomechanics and stuff like that. And that's really, that was another area is just like losing those years to shitty ass powerlifting. Um, when I could have been getting, I could have been using those years when I was actually taking a lot of drugs to get really swole. And, um, you know, like I said, instead of doing like shitty ass strength training. So I always tell guys now I have so many, what I call, uh, 
recovering powerlifters in my programs now that all wake up and like, man, I'm pain free for the first time in 10 years. Um, and I'm actually stronger than I was uh, when I was doing quote unquote strength training. And the reason, the big reason why that is because you're just not hurt, beat up anymore. If you've ever been hurt, the you know, central nervous system will actually down regulate uh, the amount of high threshold motor units it will recruit to allocate towards force production. So whenever that happens, you can't lift as much weight. And sometimes we're carrying around a significant amount of inflammation in the soft and connective tissue, um, which feels like small aches and pains. Your body knows it, your nervous system knows it. And so it's not going to be like, well, I, you're kind of messed up there in this area. So I'm not going to allow you to produce as much force as possible. So your nervous system is aware of those kind of things. So once guys get healthy, and start feeling good and they don't have pain and they have healthy tissue to work through they there's this whole level of growth that ends up happening there's this new level of strength they end up seeing and they're not in pain anymore and i've worked with so many guys like that there's any one piece of advice i give people now like don't ever go pick up do fucking barbell squats and deadlifts and bench presses and all that stupid ass shit in your training pick better movements that you can actually take the joints through the range of motion that they're designed to functional anatomy um and load them appropriately so you, you don't do any compound movements? I don't do any fucking shitty ass barbell movements. Hell no, I don't. <laughs> um, I think that when people talk about there's this complete misconception about hypertrophy works. And one is that big compound movements. That's not, has nothing to do. That's what I just thought we hit on earlier was big compound movements tend to, depending on how we're talking about, them, you want to take a movement ideally regardless of whether it's a compound movement or it's a single joint exercise and you want to execute it in a way that number one is congruent with how your actual anatomy functions. But then the other thing is that we want to execute it in a way where we're forcing uh, the tissue that we're trying to train to do the majority of the work to move that external load. So I don't do like regular, if I do squats, I'll do like a safety bar squat with my heels elevated and I maximize things like knee flexion in order to maximally load my quads. I don't do like a balance squat where you like sit back at first and then squat and you have equal amounts of like hip flexion and knee flexion. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that kind of stuff, but for example, like deadlifting, like I haven't deadlifted in uh, probably seven years. And I think deadlifts are probably the shittiest, most overrated exercise that there is. And it gives a, it creates a high degree of fatigue, but has a low degree of stimulus because it doesn't work any one particular area very hard. So instead of doing something like a barbell deadlift, do a Romanian deadlift. Um, or you can do a trap bar deadlift that allows you to get set up in a position that is much more anatomically friendly uh, and you can load your glutes better with that. So it's this switch that you have that happens over that time that you realize a lot of the stuff that you read online, like, oh, the big compounds, just sling a lot of heavy weight around the big compounds. Like that's that's a great way to make sure that you get really beat up and that you don't uh, target any specific area of muscle to load it with a concentrated degree of mechanical tension. Interesting. <laughs> you know this. No, I know. I'm thinking about. I'm. I'm thinking of the other side of what the other side will be questioning. Right? That's just the way my, my brain is working at this point. Because clearly, I, I, so it, it, it's weird. Um, we'll just use CrossFit, right? As as popular as CrossFit has become, and it's probably on its downfall <laughs> at this point. Uh, I mean, people still using the system in itself, but you you do see a large number. Yeah, you see a lot of large number of athletes with their injuries, mostly shoulder injuries and stuff like that. But you also see the successes of CrossFit, right? Um, and and I'm not saying that you're you're completely like disparaging them or, or or destroying them at this point. But how do you compare that? Like if they're seeing the result of what they, and I see your point of view. I totally do. It makes sense. You know, it it, it does. But um, it, it it's just where my brain goes. Where I'm always thinking of the other side. What would the other side say at this point? Like, well, I mean, I've had those arguments, I had those arguments with those fucking idiots from Mind Pump who used to show up on my page. Um, those guys couldn't train their their way out of their I mean, just just they they're just a an echo chamber of repeating the whole the big compounds, gen pop, this, that, whatever. Everything that I'm giving is I'm I'm talking about how the even the gen pop and average person should be training rather than just picking up barbells. I'm talking about people that want longevity and to feel good. 
So if you're like, I would never use an example of talking about something like CrossFit because that's a um, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing where I would consider it to be something more where the adaptation has occurred is just people that are just good at sports. So um, it's kind of like that guy that you went to high school with that was uh, really good on the football team, really good at basketball too, probably good baseball player, could run really fast and do all sorts of shit, was just really athletic. And that's kind of how I see CrossFit people. Because most of those guys, they were never really, really fucking strong. Like there would be a few guys here or there with like a good deadlift or something or whatever because he had good leverage. None of them were exceptionally strong. Um, none of them would be what I call exceptionally fast. And they didn't have like Iron Man type like endurance. There'd always be that 1%, like a rich Frony or something but right. like that. But, um, and none of them were jacked. Some people would see them and, and say, man, those guys are fucking jacked. I'm like, that dude is 185 pounds. That dude is not fucking jacked. Okay, can we stop? <laughs> So, um, but they were good. They were good athletes. Um, but like what I talk about when I talk about hypertrophy training is I'm talking about just training in a way that, um, we're going to get the maximum amount of muscle growth out of the tissue, but we're doing it also in a way that we're not passing on tension to the soft connective tissue, um, that basically when that stuff gets inflamed, or that gets torn, um, that's when we're, you know, we're injured and can't train very hard. So it's a combination of those two things. Um, I, I'm not saying, and I've never said this, that you can't grow or get big um, picking up heavy barbells. But the dumbest thing I always hear is a report to that is something to do with like running Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler or something. And I'm like, okay, Ronnie Coleman took 24 IU of GH a day. Um, <laughs> I don't really, and Ronnie was also like the, of genetic mutants he was the mutant of genetic mutants like right. ronnie went natural he went pro natural at 220 pounds that's literally like he's the only guy he was the biggest natural guy to ever walk the face of the planet in terms of like actual conditioning uh, i can't remember the guy's name the guy that owned um that owns metro flex down in arlington but talking about the first to. time he yeah first time he met ronnie ronnie was so big as a natural that he had on these red sweatpants and you could see the veins through, through his, his sweatpants. Legs. Yep. And because his legs were so big, they were wrapped around his, his red sweatpants and you could see the veins through him. He was completely natural at that time. Ronnie had natural muscular development that lots of other guys could never take enough drugs to get. So he went from being natural, placing last in shows, showing up 218, 222 pounds to doing one cycle of of uh of androgens and he was like 250 something pounds shredded nobody had genetics like ronnie so when people try to use ronnie like it's like godwin's law when somebody tries to compare something to the nazis or hitlers immediately they just lost the argument well when somebody tries to use ronnie coleman i always call it coleman's law because i'm like hey, if you're trying <laughs> to use ronnie coleman as an argument for that you just lost yeah it's a huge difference yeah <laughs> that's a massive difference <laughs> Well, did you have a did you have an aha moment when you were powerlifting and you're like, I gotta get out of this shit? Or do you just like, I'm over it, I wanna go do some other stuff? I don't know if there was like an epiphany that happened ever. Um definitely when I did my the last meet I did, I knew that was gonna be the last meet I'd ever do. Um, I, I guess you could say there was a moment. Um I was walking through a parking lot and I'm looking at Okay. I was walking through a parking lot and um, I was thinking I was about 288 pounds at the time. And um, I had, it was a hotel parking lot and I had a, a room there and I had to stop twice to get through the parking lot and leave them cars. You have to understand, I grew up, I grew up an athlete. Um, I was like a baseball prodigy. I was being scouted by uh, colleges with ninth grade. So um, I was, I had grown up an athlete. Um, I spent, I don't know how many years in martial arts. Powerlifting, it was the, it was lift more weights. One of the reasons I fucking despise powerlifts, lift more weights at all costs. All, no matter how many drugs you got to take, how much weight you got to gain. They used to have a, a, not to throw my friend Brandon Lilly under the bus, but he's fucking repeat that shitty mantra, uh, get your weight up. And I have, I'm like, bro, now Brandon's like in shape. I was like, bro, you were like 380 pounds one time, like, and couldn't breathe and couldn't sleep and almost died. It's not good. Uh, but the aha moment was probably when I was walking across the parking lot and I had to stop twice to get across a small parking lot. And I said, I don't ever want to feel this way again. 
I didn't ever want to feel that way again. And that was really shortly after that. I, I did my last meet and retired. And uh, the first thing I did was I contacted my buddy, Tev Trevor Cashy. And I was like, uh, hook me up, put me on a diet right now. Um, and it was more like an accountability thing. So um, I remember my, my diet at that time. It was the, uh, the chicken and peanuts diet. Trevor had me. He had, had me. It was basically eggs, whole eggs and chicken and peanuts. He's a, he's a genius, too. Um, he had, it was basically whole eggs, chicken and peanuts. And uh, I went from like 290 and I got into the 240s and I was pretty lean in, in the 240s and um, pretty much just eating whole eggs, chicken and peanuts. So and then we so slowly started swapping out uh, carbs for some of the fat intake a little bit later. He did a really good job. With it. Uh, always massive love for Trevor. His other, and Trevor did a funny thing to me during that time is that um, no matter how lean I got, he would still say I was fat and <laughs> he would still say I was fat. And he we had <laughs> we had these funny, we had these funny exchanges. I was so fucking mad because <laughs> I was sending pictures in and I'd have like ad names and he'd be like, man, you're still fat. And I was like, dude, fuck you <laughs> like, i was like in my 230s and, and he would be like uh you're gonna have to get down to about 198 to actually get <laughs> wow and dude it was i was so mad and when i stepped on stage from the show i was over 230 pounds uh, and i and i had like striated glutes and um he he told me later he's like dude i stayed after you like that because i really wanted you to see the process through and a lot of people when it gets hard, they'll drop out just as they're really about to get over that hump. Right. And um, he's like, I was just, and I'm thankful for that too, because dude, I just, it used to drive me insane every week and I'd have to mail him in pictures. And I would know he was going to tell me like, no matter how good I was feeling about myself, that I was fat. So um, I appreciated that. That kept me super motivated. And I crushed my diet every day, day in and day out and ended up absolutely peeled. And I actually held my contacts in Disney pretty close to it for almost two years after. So for the all people who say that you can't do that, that's bullshit either. Um, you can actually stay pretty damn lean year round if you're just not, if you just don't eat like an asshole. Right. Right. So I stayed very lean. I actually, I got a, a quite a bit unlean um, after I was dating this girl for quite, for a few years. And when her and I were dating, she got me into wine and we used to go out to eat once or twice a week and we drink wine and, and then when i get drunk i don't i never did that thing where i get drunk and had like beer goggles for women i had food goggles so if i get a buzz <laughs> i'm gonna eat all the food inside i didn't i don't give a shit about hooking up with anybody i just care about whatever foods around that i can eat so um since her and i were going out to eat and would drink uh, i would eat a lot a couple times a week and i don't know like if um like people would be in disbelief when I used to post pictures up of my big cheat meals. Um, but people who have eaten with me will tell you that I eat those, like I can sit down and do that. Danielle, she's right here. And we've had so many times where you sat down and where I've done those. And she's like, how are you still eating there? You're not human. That's not normal. So I'd always get that. I had one time I had a, an actual professor, professional eater that was following me. Um, and he had made a comment because people always say I can eat and I can eat with you. I've eaten everybody that's ever tried that under the table, everybody. And people are like, no, no. And I'm like, I get it. We're all dudes and we need to like have a dick measure contest. I'm like, unless you're a professional eater, I will fucking eat you under the table. And the professional eater actually did a live where he ate one of the males. He's like, he goes, it's not, he goes, uh, he goes, it was not that it's like impossible, but he goes for a guy that's not a professional eater. That's really fucking impressive. He's like, the only way I could explain it, he goes, is that you would be like a top level, like super heavyweight NPC competitor. If you're talking like in bodybuilding <laughs> standards where professional eaters are athletes pros, he's like, you're like a super heavyweight and top level NPC. And I get that from people all the time. Like, bro, you don't know. I can, I'm like, okay. And I've done that with people and they tap out way before I'm finished. And I just keep eating. So that's like, though, that's a, like, a, I don't know like either how I can do that or whatever, but um, I can eat for hours. I got stuck at this uh, Super Bowl party a few years ago where this woman cooked for 25 people and I ate for seven hours and pretty much ate all the food that she had left. So when people talk about like, oh, I'll, I can, bro, I think I can or whatever, I'm just like, okay, dude. then I'll just always make the thing. Let's go pick a place, $500, loser, loser pays for it. I, I'll never pay for it, the food. <laughs> 
<laughs> is that like a genetic thing or do you think that's just you you've increased your metabolism over time or? no um i don't know when i was going through uh my when i was trying to really grow during my teenage years i i really taught i think eating is something you can teach yourself how to do it it really is and um i i used to call it the, like the rite of passage for guys who really wanted to get big i always felt like Everybody who ever put on a substantial amount of muscle mass, I'm talking about guys who are really jacked, all have that story that they went through a period where they ate and they ate and they sucked to eat. And I've had that story. I've talked with so many guys where they're like, you're gagging on food already by the middle of the day and you still got three more gigantic meals that you have to finish that day. And you don't do that for 10 weeks. Um, you do that sometimes for six months or eight months and you just get to where you can eat so much food. Um, I have multiple deers. Like when I, when I was, a, I was 255, 256 pounds as a complete natural and like decently lean. I posted a picture many times before. And a lot of people then at that time thought I was, they would thought I was on, uh, they thought I was on androgens then. And I'd never taken the thing. I didn't, I hadn't even taken any pro, pro hormones. But I'd get up in the morning and I would eat um, like a dozen eggs and like two cups of oatmeal and then a banana. And then like I'd eat like uh, 10 McDonald's hamburgers at lunch. <laughs> and I mean, I had old, when I was going through my teenage years, I can still tell you the diet. It was, I'd work up to a dozen eggs. Um, it was a dozen eggs, two, two cups of oatmeal. I'd go in and train and I'd have four carbo coolers back then at the time, which is an insane amount. That's like wild. pretty much straight That's glucose. Wild. It was like, I don't even remember what they were. I think they were 80 grams of carbs each. So it was uh, like 320 grams of carbs just post-workout, just in drink. And then I get home and I'd eat two packs of ramen while <laughs> I put, I'd put, uh, I'd put four cups of rice, two cups of rice, which is four cups cooked. And I put on four shaker breasts. And I eat two cups of ramen as soon as I got home. Cause you know, I had to replenish all that glycogen from workout. <laughs> <laughs> you burned it all up, right? <laughs> so I would, uh, yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose any glycogen. I need to be tapped out at all times. So um, <laughs> I'd eat two packs of ramen, put on two cups of rice, four cups of cooks, four chicken breasts. I wrote this in a bodybuild.com article. I can still remember the whole diet because I did it for six months. And then I'd eat the chicken breasts and the rice when it was done. And, uh, and I would have either, um, then I have two more meals and the other two more meals will always be two foot long meatball subs from Subway. Um, and then I'd have a T-bone steak that night, with two baked potatoes and salad. And then the kicker was actually this shake that I would make. And, um, uh, I got it from, uh, Ellington Darden's book. Uh, I think it's called bigger muscles in 42 days, which I did at the time. And see, there's nothing in lifting I've never done or haven't lived. <laughs> It was um it was two cups of milk, um, two cups of two cups of ice milk, which is like ice cream. And it was uh it was two whole eggs, peanut butter, a banana, malted milk powder, K Ro syrup. Malted milk powder. powder. <laughs> yeah. So that was, was and you would blend powder. that up and it would fill up the blender, like the whole blender. Now here was what I did not know because I, I did a uh, what my followers do when they don't read my fucking captions and they start asking dumb shit questions is I didn't finish reading the part where Ellington said that what you do is you make this shake up and you just have it over the course of the day. Oh, <laughs> you did it one sitting. <laughs> Which makes sense when you think about it, right? Because if you're trying to add, let's say you're trying to add an extra thousand calories a day, a real simple way is make that shake up and have, drink half of it over just over the course of the day. Cause it was like a 2200 calorie shake. So I would sit there and drink that whole thing in a sitting. And I would absolutely hurt. Like it would by that. I would, I got like, I went through periods of that. Like we're just, like I guess I went through like where you're gagging, just, just get your food down where you hurt. Um, I've talked about that with other guys where you kind of have those moments where you burp and throw up. Mm -hmm. um, you go through that stuff and other guys, that's why when guys are talking about how they won't grow, if you sit at home and don't train at all and eat a shit ton of food, you'll still, the scale will still at least move because you're getting fat as fuck. Right. So when guys tell me that I can't grow, the only thing I think is you flat out just do not eat enough. And they always swear they're eating a bunch. Every skinny motherfucker on the face of the planet will tell you 
He would talk about all the Taco Bell that he eats. He would talk to you about, but it's always like this one meal. I'm like, okay, do that eight times today. <laughs> do that meal eight fucking times today. Because that argument drives me crazy. After all these years, they're like, bro, like, you don't know, I eat so much. I'm like, tell me about it, dude. Talk to me about this, all this food that you're putting down. I want to hear about it. And then he'll be like, no, bro, you know, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I get up in the morning, you know, and um, sometimes I'm running late for work. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Why aren't you getting your skinny ass up at four o'clock and making up fucking a dozen eggs and two cups of oatmeal and a banana and some peanut butter? And why aren't you doing that? Oh, man, I don't. Uh, well, you know, I mean, we smoke weed at night and stuff. And, you know, <laughs> like, and so I'm like, OK, so tell me about this food. And they're like, well, you know, like, so then I'll have like, uh, you know, a little song, song at work where, you know, like out of vending machine, you know, and then I'll grab like a sandwich from this, this place, mom and pop shop across the street or whatever. And then, I'll, you know, by that night, I'm really hungry, man. I'll have like four or five soft tacos, whatever. I'm like, OK, so you're eating like. 15, 800, 1800 calories a day. And then you wonder why you can't grow. I was packing down eight to 9,000 calories a day every day for months, months, and months. We sat down and we actually, we did some tracking on my cheat meals. Um, and they were always between seven and 8,000 calories. What? <laughs> a week's worth of food in a day. <laughs> so meal. For people, for, that's why I laugh at people when I've had people like, well, I can do that. I'm like, okay. Most people do 10,000 <laughs> calorie challenges in a day. I'll sit down for an evening and do that. Have you guys ever had, what was the one night we, when, um, what was those crumble cookies? You guys ever had crumble oh, yeah, cookies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crumble, yeah. Yeah, and I ate like a whole box of crumble whole cookies. Box. <laughs> that was after our food. So what was the food that night? It was burgers, wasn't it? So I ate two burgers from Red Robins, um, like two whole bags of steak fries, um, a whole, I think it was probably 12, Crumble cookies because people told me I couldn't eat all those. Crumbles. Well, we got twenty four. It was twenty four in those in those three boxes. Remember? No, it was thirty something because it was like eighty dollars in cookies. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> but I kept eating them. But it, we sat down and figured them out because the crumble cookies alone were six hundred and fifty calories, give or take, something like that. So it was like it was some ridiculous amount just from cookies alone. And that was after the burgers and fries and all that kind of stuff. And that's pretty normal for me to have seven, some seven to nine, probably, I probably definitely had some 10,000 calorie meals um, during that. And I, I just, I really love food. I think I love food probably as much as anybody, even those 600 pound fat person life shows or whatever. I love food just as much as those people. I just don't like how food makes me feel. I just prefer to be lean and sexy. So that's the struggle. Yeah. Quite a struggle it is. How long does it take you to pack that stuff away? Like a couple hours? No, hour. like we do those kind. It's just like maybe 30 minutes. Oh. Yikes. I could crush like a whole pizza and some extra, but I don't know how fast I could do that shit. That's for sure. No, that's, <laughs> I eat really fast. I actually not even take 30 minutes. The desserts will eat on like the whole night. I'll snack on, but like the whole meal part, I'll eat like 15 minutes. So I eat really fast. So like I can go put down like two burgers and like a whole thing of fries and like then some cake and stuff like that in like 10 or 15 minutes max. Wow. If even that long, maybe it's pretty ridiculous. I eat really fast. So, and then, <laughs> but then the rest of the stuff, I'll just eat for the rest of the night. So I'll start a cheat meal at like four and I'll probably eat 8,000 calories in the first 20 minutes. And then the rest <laughs> I'll eat, like I'll, I'll snack on stuff. So yeah, that was something, like I said, I don't think that's like a, I don't think that's like a genetic thing or whatever. I, I just think that I taught myself how to eat over those years. And oh, then that's just, that's just something that you stick with. And like, if I had a way, if there was a drug I could take where I could eat all the foods that I wanted, and then um, I just didn't get any body fat, but it took 20 years off my life, I'd probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. well, geez, right? He gave me the worst look just now. <laughs> oh, oh man. Um, this is a this is this, while you were talking, this is a bunch of stuff that was going through my head. Well, you said you were you were into martial arts. Are you still into martial arts? No, I um the last um I did Krav Maga here for like five years, but we had a lot of um we had some uh professional fight instructors in the uh the studio there where we were at. 
So we had a, a lot of local, uh, there was, there's a lot of uh, pro leagues out here in the Midwest where you consider like, uh, you know, like feeder leagues for like yep. the UFC and stuff. So we'd have a lot of fighters come through here. And I was one of the main spar- sparring partners um, for guys out here. And the one thing that is pretty difficult to do is like, you kind of have to make a, a decision. Uh, at least I did. Uh, that was when I was powerlifting too. Uh, that's another thing. If you're going to, if you're going to be in MMA of pretty much any kind, you're usually going to be, routinely beat up yeah. so um i uh, i just it just got to where i was like constantly beat up i was constantly hurting uh man we were hitting pads and you're holding pads um that shocked from like like the force of of uh either throwing um or just accepting you know blows um just my elbows and um were my elbows were always hurting something on me was always hurting luckily i'd never had i've never had any knee problems in my whole life but something on me was always hurting um, from fighting. So after like five years, I decided that I just didn't, I didn't want to do that anymore. And, um, and yeah, I just never, I just never did that anymore after that. Um, probably in retrospect, that's another one of those things. I think every guy on the face of the planet does jujitsu now. Uh, I think yep. I'm the only, I think I'm the only man on the planet who does not do jujitsu. Um, and I, and now I'm at a place where it's like, I don't have any tattoos and I haven't gotten any tattoos. Um, and now it's like I'm the rebel for not having tattoos because every person I know has tattoos and I'm actually the outcast for not having any. And now I have the same attitude about jujitsu. I'm like, I would like to go take jujitsu, but I feel like I'm the only guy who doesn't do jujitsu. So I'm just going to stay the only guy. I bet there's one of you three that does jujitsu, right? I do not. Wow. I think, okay, no. So we're the only four guys on the face of the planet. Oh, no, no. I used to have my own MMA school, so I've done it. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so, yeah. But do you still practice? Not jujitsu, just because of like, the pain and stuff like that. I got kids and everything. I still do a lot of the uh, the Muay Thai. I do a lot of the Thai. I was going to say, if there, yeah. dude, if there was any one thing I, I honestly, act being real, go back, um, is that if I would have spent, say, 20 years doing Muay Thai, uh, because man, if you can stuff a guy's shoot, that's mm-hmm. a big jujitsu guy, and then just beat his fucking just ass. Just beat him up, exactly. Any, anything, <laughs> any more pleasurable? Because jujitsu guys talk so much shit online now, and I look back when Chuck was in his prime, and Chuck was such a great fucking wrestler, and but he never took anybody down. He he could you couldn't take Chuck down, so he'd make you stand up and he'd beat your ass. Yeah, and. Um, and that was uh, that's kind of what I think would be uh, if you had just to just have a good enough. You don't need to be great at, at actually um, submitting Everything. people. Yeah, yeah. You just need to be have a not be able to be taken down and force a jujitsu guy who can't fight on his feet to stand up and then beat his ass. <laughs> I mean, you own a studio. Tell me that's not true. No, it's true. It's true. Right? I mean, I, like it, when you go down, guys, they can't. Yeah, they, they, they don't know how to get hit. <laughs> yeah, man, people can't take hits. It's not easy taking hits. As soon as you get stunned, you look at you're like, what What just happened? What? Yeah, did he, did he Joe, just hit me? <laughs> right, he Joe, Rogan, Joe Rogan, who's honestly probably one of the baddest martial arts guys on the planet. Oh, um, yeah. He, Joe would always say that. He'd say, because uh, you force a jiu-jitsu guy to stand up, you can turn a black belt into a blue belt in a, in a, in a, in a couple of face yeah, punches. Instantly. Like, yeah. like, yeah, they don't, yeah once, yeah, once they get you to the ground, yeah, you're kind of fucked. But I always thought that uh, if, you could, if you could just do a Muay Thai, I have a funny, a funny story about a buddy of mine that trained, you know Master Toddy out in Vegas? Toddy, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah he used he to be in Las Vegas. Toddy. He's back in Thailand now, though. But he was yeah, he trained, yeah. he trained with Toddy for a few years, and we were talking about the difference. We were literally in a Las Vegas hotel room one time, and we were talking about the difference between round kicks, between a, a Muay Thai round kick, which has more of that slicing, kind yep. of that, that stiff leg right slicing. Down, right, yeah, like that. Shit, exactly. Right right down, yep. Round kick and the difference between that, and it's like a traditional um, martial arts round kick, which is more, it's kind of, it comes Sweet. up the other way through, through your hips, right? It's a little yep. different. And... Um, we were talking about that. He's like, here, man. He's like, hold this pillow. He's going to throw a leg kick on me. Um, <laughs> and we were talking about that. And so he, the, the maid is in the room, fucking cleaning the room. And so like, we didn't have any pads. So he just, he, I just grabbed the pillow and held the pillow to my thigh. And he kicked the shit out of me and fucking dropped <laughs> me right there in front of the maid. And I'm like, dude, what? I looked at him like, dude, what the fuck? He's like, you're a big guy. You can take it. And <laughs> yeah, like. I, right like, on the that, quad, right? <laughs> Dude, I don't even think that um, I was telling that to a friend of mine who who like every guy that watches fights think they they know shit about 
Yeah. When I watch fights, it's really weird because um, I tell most guys, they don't understand this, that none of those guys that talk shit, they could stand up after a legit leg kick that you see a guy take 10, 12, 15 up in a fight. And we used to do leg conditioning. It was the worst night of the week, leg conditioning kicks. And you're only going at 60 to 70%. But, dude, you can't walk right for the next three days after. That was another thing I got tired of, just, you know, like just going in. And even if you're not, man, it, that shit is so painful. Um, dude, I'm sure if you did a lot of movie tie, there's so much that is your shin conditioning, your leg kick conditioning. Do that's, I mean, it'll turn you into a statue over time. Oh, yeah. The, the amount of cartilage and broke. My knuckles are all jacked up. My hands are all messed up for, for things. I got carpal tunnel now <laughs> from all these things. Trigger finger from my, from my fingers getting jacked up. My knees, yeah, I, I, it's not fun anymore. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do this stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's fun to watch. I'm like, yeah, this is dumb. Why am I so, doing this? I'll pay you if you want to if you want to jump me. Here's my money. I don't care. <laughs> I don't. Well, do the I think the app the average guy. What's even worse about the internet is the average guy just walking around. I'll beat his fucking ass. <laughs> because like the I, you know what i'm talking about too right the average yeah. guy walking around he doesn't know how to fight and like i just okay i'm just gonna put you in the clinch right now and i'm gonna beat the shit out of you in close like that and the average guy like he doesn't understand that but you get when you're growing up like you think as a kid because you think you need martial arts because you're going to be getting in all these jean-claude van damme back yeah. alley fights one of the worst stuff. guys in the world too <laughs> right it's, yeah exactly Terrible. but i mean you think but like fuck man i'm gonna have to be doing all these flying spinning crescent kicks like <laughs> You know, knocking people out all over the place. And then, like, i that's never happened to me in my life. Like, I think I've been in two street fights. I put one guy in the hospital. Um, and, like, in neither occasion, like, in both occasions, I actually knew the person. But I've, I've only been, like, oh, there was one other, like, a, a brawl I was in in the parking lot. But actually, we beat up people with cow bones. So that was, that's a totally different story. With but, cow bones? What? Cow bones. Wow. Where did you get those from? They were just the cow? From a, da from a dairy farm. So you would literally go out and get cow bones? Like fucking cow bones, man. So that's like a, a funny story. Bat. I've got lots of stories. Get a so, <laughs> um, I worked on a dairy farm for a couple of years. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like the femur of a cow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah that's what I was going to say. I was like, you actually just went and got a dead cow. Yeah. So we were, I worked on a dairy farm and we took these, um, had this cow had died, this big cow had died and we, we took her off to the cow graveyard and I'd never been out there. I'd worked out there for two years, but I'd never been to the cow graveyard. And there, it was just like miles and miles. You could see of these cow skeletons. And um, I picked up a femur and like the, a femur, of a, like from a cow, you know, it's really long and it's got this, the, the, the head of the femur, right. Yeah. It's on there. So it just looks like a big weapon. And I told my buddy Aaron, I was like, dude, we could actually like, you know, like sand these down a little bit, put some tape on them. <laughs> could beat the fuck out of somebody with one of these he's like yeah that's a pretty good idea so we actually did that. <laughs> that's a pretty good idea so we literally like this was, i was probably like i think i was probably 18 or 19 at the time we literally took um like we had, took three of these cow bones these femurs and we literally took them back and washed them off and cleaned them up put some tape around them and stuck them in the truck and it was probably a month or so later we were out at this club and it was me and Aaron and Josh and Mickey Joe. Josh was 6'10", 300 pounds. And Mickey Joe was like 6'5". And like all my friends were big, big dudes. And um, this guy, this was back when you could smoke in the club. Oh, and yeah. this was, yeah. guy turned and burned his, uh, my buddy Josh, he had uh, his, his, uh, his cigarette ashes went on Josh's brand new Tommy Hilfiger shirt and burned a hole in it. You guys remember Tommy Hilfiger shirt? Yeah, this is the, exactly. the 90s. <laughs> exactly. So jo all Josh said was, that's really cool of you, bro. Are you always this cool? And <laughs> that's all he said. And the guy got mad at him. And Mickey, I don't know if you guys had a friend like this. Mickey was the friend that we had that whenever Mickey was with us, something bad was going to happen. Yep, it yeah. doesn't, Always one. I could go, we, me and Josh and Eric could do stuff together for months and months and months. Nothing would ever happen. Mickey would come out with us one time and bad shit would happen. So Mickey gets in this argument with this guy. We go to leave the club, walk into the parking lot. And then um, Mickey and Josh are still talking about these assholes in the club. And Aaron goes, I don't know if you guys look behind us, but there's like 20 dudes following us now. So after this guy burnt the hole in Josh's shirt and Josh, Mickey and this guy got into it, this guy went and got all his friends. They had come in from out of town. There's like 20 of them. 
and they were following us in the parking lot, going to beat us up in the parking lot. So Aaron is like, we just need to get to the truck and get the cow bones out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh and Mickey didn't know what the fuck we was talking about. <laughs> he's like, I, they're like cow bones in the truck. They're like, there's some cow bones in the truck. <laughs> Wasn't registering on them. We were literally talking about actual cow bones. They thought it was like a made up word. So if you told somebody you had some cow bones to beat you up with, they wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so it's actual cow bones. So as we're walking through um, the parking lot, uh, Mickey, we were looking around and Mickey Joe had disappeared. This is the South, so his name was Mickey Joe. So Mickey had disappeared. The guy that started all the shit, he disappeared. He wasn't even with us anymore. So we unlocked the truck and... Um, I just, I pulled one of the cow bones out. I got one. Josh got one. Aaron got one. And I said, the best thing to do, and this is one of the things I did learn in martial arts early on. If you ever fight more than one guy, um, number one, get them in a single file. And the first guy, you have got to, right you have right. got to absolutely blast him as hard as possible. Because more times than not, you guys ever see that movie uh, with Tom Cruise, Jack Reacher, the first one? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's a really cool scene that where he fights those five guys and he's like, he goes, it's, what are you talking about? He goes, it's five on one. He's like, it's three on one. He goes, <laughs> and, and he, right there, when he said that, I got chill bumps. So I was like, growing up, that's what you know if you ever fight one more than one person, that there's maybe one or two guys that are really going to be about it. The rest of them are just there to back up their boys. And the first time, and I said this to, to this was, I'm like 18 or 19 at the time, and I'd already said, if you crack the first fucking dude really hard, make sure the rest of them would be like, I don't want any of that shit. So I was that guy. I pulled the cow bone out, and then the first guy stepped up. Man, I blasted him, and he just dropped like a rock. And you could see the the rest of them just split off into the oh shit, I don't want any of that. <laughs> now what had, Mickey had actually done when he had left was he had went to the 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 sports bar next to us that was full of bouncers that were friends with us, and then he got all of them, and they came out and actually did like a brave heart flanked them from the side thing so it was like pit bouncers and we beat the fuck out of these dudes in the parking lot with cow bones and bouncers that so that's my that's my own that, that didn't require any martial arts I just used the cow bones <laughs> <laughs> that was a martial arts question and you got the cow bones that's right man it was that was like real brave heart shit it was uh like real brave heart shit right there and I was uh and I was uh William Wallace and and uh, there was like, you know, freedom on the other side of it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was, uh, that was, that was probably, there were other couple of times, but like I said, growing up, I, I think that we all had a, a somewhat bit of ingrained in this. I think, especially if you grew up around what I consider more masculine men or warrior types that had that warrior ethos kind of in them. And if you ran an MMA studio, you would know that. Yeah, um so that we grew up believing though that we were going to be fucking fighting like every week right like because oh, yeah. in your teenage years that's kind of how it is like you like i i grew up in the south and i fought a lot like i got a lot of fights growing up but like after i became like an actual adult um i generally as adults we don't go off whooping people's asses nope. i tell dudes all the time i here's the expos i'll be at if you ever want some smoke you can just say something to me they always say they're going to, I've never, ever, I've seen dudes at Expos talk shit online. I'd be like, bro, do you have something you want to say to me? And they never want to do anything in person. And I mean, I've thrown down a fucking million times in person. I've lost fights. I've got my ass beat. That's like, it's not a big, you don't realize like it's not a big deal. There's always some dude that can whip your ass. But my point is about those guys that talk shit online like that, but hide behind like private profiles and accounts like that. I'm like, oh, you guys are all the same. Like you're, you're hiding behind a phone. You're never going to say anything in person. Um, I've run into guys like you like that in person a million times you guys never have anything to say i think guys who really want to throw down no throwing down there could be some bad shit happen you don't want to throw down you don't want that smoke um but if it has to happen it has to happen i think the biggest thing is um i don't go around talking shit to anybody online nobody i you can't find me a comment from me anywhere on somebody else's social media where i get into arguments or i talk shit to them I get people come to my social media to start shit with me. That's pretty, and it's so weird. I just tell these guys, why don't you just not follow me, dude? If you don't like, I, it's such a social media is so weird to me now. It's really, it's so weird to me. Um, but I do think 
that so many people these days, especially guys, probably it's probably the generation after us that didn't grow up actually understanding. Jordan Peterson uh, said, did you guys read any, read any of Jordan Peterson? Jordan stuff Peterson yep. Brilliant, right? And he said that the reason yeah. <laughs> um, in, in like basically man-to-man confrontations that it was always the ideology that you had to have a certain amount of respect in your words because there was an undercurrent that there could be violence that could occur if you did not. And I think that's the generation that we grew up in. And then before us was like, you need to learn to mind your tongue because if you're talking in person, there's always a chance that violence could escalate, that it could escalate. And I think that the generations that grew up after us that grew up online don't understand that concept. And then they can, get behind a phone or a laptop or whatever and then they can say whatever they want and there's no repercussions where when we were all growing up um if you were going to run your mouth about something then you understood there could be some consequences for running your mouth about shit and well, we, we, when we were growing up we didn't have the computers to, to hide behind right? we, we said it right to each other's faces if we right to each other's face <laughs> yeah there was no reason to do that you know these guys these days are and i say i see it in the martial arts schools all the time you know, I see it in the martial arts schools. These guys, they, they talk, you know, they come in because they've seen the YouTube videos that they could do the moves. I'm like, listen, you know, they've got all these online universities that teach you all these moves, but real time, it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless you right. practice it over and over again. You know, there, there's, there's things, especially about fighting um, that, and I always had this unbelievable in, insatiable appetite for contact because i was a middle linebacker for 13 years i played football good I, lord I, what I, haven't you done yeah, yeah <laughs> I, uh, I felt there was nothing better than running into a guy as fast as you could and absolutely destroying and blasting that is the most magnificent feeling in the world there's nothing else in my life that's ever eclipsed that i would actually say that actually even uh, uh reclaiming my relationship with my girls is right below running into a guy as fast as you can <laughs> And putting his lights out. There's something special and magnificent about that feeling that it's hard to describe. Um, I so I have to tell my kids if they ever watch this, I'm like, girls, I love you. But the times <laughs> that I got to run into dudes and absolutely slobber, uh, knock them like and just into like the next world. There's something and not feeling it. And where like the first day in football, right? And lead me back around to the MMA thing. That's what I was gonna say. Okay, so the thing you can't learn in MMA is how you're gonna respond once you take that first hard crack. Right. It's like that's not something you can learn, like even from your instructors, the first time you get cracked really fucking hard. How do you respond to that? And the one of the things I figured out I had from a young age was I I love that. I love like I, you can't teach that. So there's some people once they get hit, man, they like they don't they don't like that. They don't want any of that. And I figured yeah. out from a young age, I was like, ooh, I really like that. <laughs> and so when I was playing middle linebacker, that was the thing. After your body gets conditioned, the same thing we were talking about earlier with like Muay Thai fighting. Once you get to where um, you don't, like you can run into, your body actually gets conditioned to the contact, um, when you're, whether you're fighting or whether it's football. It's a pretty superhero invincible type feeling where you can just take like a full shot from somebody and you're just fine. You know, like that was one of the best things. I mean, I've taken shots at football, man. The worst one always is specialty. Some little 180 pound dude, like that runs like a, a, a three, two forty, like blindsides you, like cracks you in your dome, like, like, you know, ear holes you. I always hated that shit because like, but like, well, like coming at me, like head on, like full steam, like that was where I always thought it was at. Uh, Ray Lewis was my dude. Um, Ray, Lewis. <laughs> Ray Lewis was my dude, man. Ray, Ray Lewis nuts. was Zach Thomas. Yeah, but Ray Lewis and Zach Thomas, but Ray was, he was so next level about that because he knew how to take the best angles um, on people um, in order to leverage uh, his hip into the hit. He never was a dirty player, dirty tackle. So, yeah, there's, yeah, I realize when we go through these, like, there's not a whole lot of areas I can't talk about in terms of like, like, like manship. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, that's that. It's 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 insane how that completely segued into this whole entire thing. Um, but you know, I'm gonna go back to the fitness aspect of, of where where I was. You know, the question was in, in the MMA. I was curious on your point of view on on basically weight cutting for all these weight uh, for the different divisions. Uh, and I was you know, that's that's where I was gonna leave with it. But you, you went off on a pretty good angle also. Um, okay. but, but, you know, on, on how you feel about it in, in the conditioning that, that happens with these, cause it's, I, I'm trying to, I want to start a, an MMA podcast also on top of this, because I, I do, I still do deal with a lot of 
uh, professional fighters. I used to train a lot of professional fighters in New York City. Um, Muay Thai fighters specifically, not MMA. I don't do the whole, uh, I've, I've taught it. I'm not good at the ground game at all. Um, right. I'm, I'm better That's at okay, man. We're kindred so. spirits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> I just got to keep the lights on. But uh, yeah, you, what, what you're taking all these, this weight cutting for, for these athletes that are trying to stay in, the, in that point of, uh, you know, mindsets and stuff like that is it is it worth it or do you think they should stop it um kind of there here here's how i feel about it. i feel like um there's and i think this has been researched pretty well is that once the weight cut exceeds i want to say it's something to the tune of seven percent of your body weight something give or take in there that there's a consistent um reduction in performance output within a certain time period after that so for guys who need to cut weight, my suggestion is to be um, in shape all the time. Number one, be in shape all the time. And then to fight within a proximity of your weight class so that the weight that you do have to cut doesn't have an effect on performance um, after you recomp. So if a lot of this, so now some people that do crazy weight cuts, you know, and still not be hampered by it. I'm, I'm trying to think of back in the day. Um, some guys that used to do big weight cuts and not be hampered, but it, it escapes me. I don't remember if GSP had to do big weight cuts, but GSP. GSP no, he's was, always he's always kept it. He's one of the. I think like, he I, was I really close. Coach. Um, uh, most of the time, when I would see people, here here's just my perception. When I would see people fail weight cuts, more times than not, they were they were fat, they were out of shape, uh, and I think that's a discipline thing. Um, and I would say for the guys who are going to be serious about it, um, you know, to get in shape and stay within the proximity of the top end of whatever weight class that you plan on. So if you're fighting, um, you know, in 205, like I don't think a weight cut that you need to do more than, say, 12, 13 pounds at the most. So you'd, you'd, you'd want to be, say, 218-ish, um, something like 218. But but I mean, you think about it, man, 218 really lean is big as fuck. So yeah. um, you're probably going to be a 6'2 or 6'3 guy um, at that weight. And that's really scary to think about. That's, that was always the scariest, in my opinion, weight class. A lot of times uh, those guys that are 205 could still have a big ass gas tank, uh, but could still lay the lumber. Right. So I think for that, my opinion for people who are going to cut weight is get your ass in shape. And figure out what what weight class are you going to have the greatest amount of, like you can still have um, you can still have your gas tank, but you're still strong. But then you're not having to do these big ass weight cuts that are going to potentially hamper your performance or may not even make weight uh, come come weight day um, for like prior to the fight. So so you know the reasons we obviously know the reasons why most guys would cut weight is to uh, after they'll make. The lower weight in order to fight the smaller person, right? Because it's right. actually really, when they're, but the problem, gonna, but the problem with that is since everybody's cutting weight, it's not really happening, mm -hmm. right? It, and it's weird because you were just you were just talking about certain people. I think of somebody like a Nick Diaz who's like six two, and he cuts down to one fifty five, right? And I'm just like I, I don't understand, and he's it's like that's disgusting looking, right? I'm like how do you how do you feel like this is good for you in long term? And you, I mean, he's already like thirty four years old at this point, been doing it for so long. I feel like he's destroying his endocrine system. He's, he's destroying so much stuff for his longevity, even though he does Ironmans. Guys like that, I'm just like, why, why do we do this stuff? You know, it yeah, doesn't make and sense. Nick and Nate, that was the one thing about them I always admired, man. Those guys had gas tanks for days. They would do all right. those, uh, Incredible. those Ironman events and and um, what's it called? Those triathlons, triathlons and shit like that. Yep. Um, but, you know, I don't I don't know what the, um, if there's like long-term, ramifications for consistent weight cuts or if they're big weight cuts i can't imagine smaller weight cuts having any significant long-term ramifications to either metabolism or or endocrine system or anything like oh, okay. that where it's like you're talking 12 to 15 pounds i don't know if the larger ones like i said i would think i think they they would cut something like 20 plus pounds wouldn't they yeah they were that's what i was i was like it's 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 insane how those these guys do it now you know, everyone's like they're they're very science based, or like I don't know. You you've kept up with I have to assume you've kept up with it with someone like T.J. Dillashaw, who right. dropped, who who got he got popped for Epoch, right? But he dropped down. He's five six. He dropped down to one twenty five when he natural weight is one forty five, and he looked like so beyond emaciated. He looked dead, he looked dead right. walking around at one twenty five, um, and and I was just like I I don't, you know, I'm always wondering why people 
in the industry don't don't advise at this point. Like, I don't understand where, where, this, where why this doesn't happen. I feel like someone like you has that platform in order to be like, guys, how stupid are you being? Especially how how open you are about those things. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, you know, I, I, and I think that again, that comes back to somebody a lot of times um, still ascribing to old methodologies that most people have, they don't realize we've outgrown. And that was the one that was like, okay, so you drop the weight classes to fight the smaller guy, but what's really happening is it's two just larger guys, both cutting weight to fight each other at fighting close to the same weight class. Not that it doesn't happen that you don't end up fighting a smaller guy, but um, I don't, I don't, if you're fighting a smaller guy, but you've made a significant weight cut and your performance was hampered. A lot of times that ends up being an equilibrium, right? Like that it's an equalizer. In other words, a smaller guy that didn't have to cut very much weight or any at all, but feels great on fight day in comparison to the larger guy who feels like dog shit because he had to do a 22 pound recomp. Who has the advantage there? Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you're moving really slow. Right. Uh, so like you have, you know, you have, you know, you know, you feel like you have um, uh, lead in your legs and, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have your explosiveness and your power and that kind of stuff. And the other guy feels great. So what would be an interesting metric uh, to see would be something if they had like, um, Fighters who had cut more than I want to say it's seven percent, but I had to look it up. But I, if it's say fighters that cut more than ten percent of their body weight, um, what were the outcomes in those fights consistently? And if you could show that oh. metric, then you would have an answer, right? So, if you looked at, we have enough history. If you look at a few decades of fights where guys had cut more than, say, you know, something like ten percent of their body weight, or see where the cutoff was. So it's like there's, in my opinion, there there's probably some trend where when you exceed a specific weight cut consistently, that there's probably going to be a significant uh, diminish in performance um, due to, uh, you know, the amount of electrolytes and water and everything that you end up dumping out of that, including glycogen and everything else that you got to do. That's, that's, it's just too impossible to recomp that you can, you can fight at a high level after that. But I think that would be a metric and maybe somebody, I'm, I'm sure somebody has done that. I, I don't think it's I, that I've just like sat here and thought that a podcast, but I, I just have never seen. Maybe, maybe you have. Maybe we've just come up with something new to do right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll sure. literally look it up after we get off the podcast because I like to know that kind of shit. Um, <laughs> but there's got to be a metric out there that shows after a certain percentage of your body weight that when you cut weight for X amount, 7, 10, 10 12, whatever percent, that there's a trend where you see um, – more fights lost due to larger weight cuts or something. Right. So I, I would think there would have to be a trend there. I would I would think, for example, like a three to five percent body weight cut for weight loss wouldn't have much of an effect for most people. But I would definitely could see that cutting more than seven to ten percent of your body weight could probably have a point of um, of a reduction in fight performance after. That's a good one. I think we all definitely have to look into that real quick. Um, did you guys have anything? Well, going back to what you said way earlier about uh, there's probably nothing you haven't tried in the uh, fitness realm. I saw this coming up on your stories a lot lately. You bring this up a lot. It's like we come from an era of, all right, I've read that, saw that. Let's try that. And now people all want to be spoon fed. Where do you think like we hit this crossover? Like, just give me the answers so I know instead of actually just implementing it and seeing how it works. I mean, the only thing that I can think is that a lot of it is, uh, is just, just the internet. Because when I was, when I was learning, the, you were forced to go in and try things. You, you had a magazine in front of you or a book. And then, so you literally had to learn. I remember going back to Jim Wendler and Jim and I talked about this. When he learned how to squat, he learned how to squat off of a, a poster board that was on um, <laughs> the, um, what's it called? The field house, you know, weight room at, in football, right? Like it was a, it was a basically how to squat big poster, like how did he look at the poster and here's the poster told you the things to do for your squat. And that's how you learn how to squat. So most of us during that time, we grew up we were reading magazines and books and we're like, oh, OK. And I remember John Meadows and I used to talk about this all the time that we love writing programs. And then people nowadays, they can't even get their head out of their ass for three seconds. between I did that on my live this morning talking about because I get so many questions about what's better this split or that split or whatever. I'm like, bro, why don't you go do them and find out? I don't think a lot of these douchebags want to go out and do stuff. Just go do stuff. Quit, get offline and go actually implement some methodologies. 
um, I don't care necessarily even always care what like some like study said. Um, my favorite researcher is Chris Beardley. Chris does a good job of what I think is he can look at research and say whether it's applicable to the real world. And people don't ask that. They just point in a study and say, here's a here's a methodology with an outcome. I'm like, okay, but nobody does this in the real world. It's like uh, the whole uh, protein, um, you can't store protein as fat. And then um, me and Lane Norton, we didn't get into it about that, but he tried to, he said technically that's true, but didn't try to talk around it. Uh, but my buddy Alan Eric, I'm going to shut his shit down. And Alan, you he was know, on the podcast. We had him on. <laughs> yeah. Alan is like, he's the fucking man. So, um, you know, talk, you know, talked about that. But um, what I was getting through there is like Lane liked the, the metabolic ward study better than the Antonio studies. The Antonio studies were real world shit. That's how we look at how people would use high protein diets in the real world. Well, sometimes people get these arguments because they're like, what do you think about this study or that study? I'm like, okay, but did you actually read it and understand that none of the things that they actually tested are like real world applicable? They're just looking for specific outcomes of certain stuff. They're not actually giving you a blueprint for how to do something. They're just looking for an outcome to something that is a methodology. So you have to be able to differentiate between when you read something like, is this an actual, is this trying to give me something that I can apply into my training and get better from? Or are they just looking for an outcome because they're trying to get um, a small bit of information for the larger picture? So a lot of people can't separate those and understand that that is the pro that's part of the scientific process. That it's not always about like some final nail in the coffin. It's that we're consistently researching stuff to get more answers to the larger picture. So I think what a lot of these guys do when they get online, first off, number one, they have access to so much information. There's so many dissenting opinions that they end up reading a thousand different opinions and they don't know which one is right. Here at the end of the day, this is the one that is right. Factually, if you want to grow muscle, that you have to be able to do some sets that have mechanical tension. That's how muscles detect. They detect tension. And so that mechanical process that mechanical signal kicks off a biological signal okay so without mechanical tension you don't have mTOR kinase get kicked off and then you don't have p6 whatever i always forget that p697k or whatever and then muscle protein synthesis and then you don't end up having more myofibrils that be that are created within the muscle that's how you grow muscle so you have to have you have to do enough hard sets in your training that are very close to failure or to failure to accumulate mechanical tension to create a need for adaptation or, or tissue remodeling. That's indisputable. That's all you really need to know. That's it. That's all you really need to know. Now, from there, you need people to go, well, how many sets? How many? And I tell them, well, if you're training really hard, you'll know. If you're training really hard, you'll know. So how many people I get guys ask me, like, why are you really doing one set failure? I'm like, because you're not looking at the big picture of things. You're not doing one, so you're doing one set of failure for that exercise. And then if you can do hundred pounds for 10 reps in that exercise, and then over the course of three weeks, you're doing 120 pounds for 10 reps. Like you may not see it yet. Okay. But the only reason why that is happening is because there's new contractile proteins in the muscle that can do that. They can create, they can produce more force for that exercise. So the muscle did get larger, it might not just be visible to the eye yet. There's not enough that's accumulated that's visible to the eye. But you do that for 10 years and you'll have a lot of muscle compared to where you were 10 years prior. So the guys get so hung up on, is it, the, one of the ones I hear, is it better to do a push-pull split compared to, um, I, I'm sorry, a push-pull legs compared to upper lower? I'm like, it doesn't fucking matter. That doesn't fucking matter. That's not the, that's not the right question. The right question is, am I training hard enough to create a need for adaptation and is progressive overload occurring in my training? So if you're doing those two things, the rest of the shit, take care of yourself. Base your frequency and your volume off of those questions. If you're training really hard, you can't do a lot of volume and you don't need to. If progressive overload is happening, which means you're actually doing more weight for the same amount of reps or you're doing more reps with the same weight over weeks and weeks and weeks and months, if that's occurring, then your training's working. That's all you need to know. That's it. Keep it simple. Well, because everyone wants to. I know it's it's like wait, when you really explain it, it's like well that that makes sense all of a sudden, and sometimes people just they want they want the magic pill. 
right? They, they want the, the automatic formula and they're like, how do I do that? I'm like, I can't deal with well, it. Well, like one of the reasons I get asked this, and this is another area that people don't get because they think I'm being an asshole, people will ask for my diet. And I'm like, I'm not giving you my diet because somebody will say, well, can you lay out your diet? Can you give me the macros? Can you give me the I'm like, no, because the reason why that you think you need that is because if it works for me, then you can just follow that and then it'll work for you. That's not teaching you anything. I tell guys the reason why you need to go out and learn how to do this is because it's it's like the whole <laughs> it's the fish thing where the guy comes up to the starving guy, tells the guy gives up hungry, will you give me some fish? And the guy goes, Hey man, I'm gonna take you out and teach you how to fish. And so every day when you're hungry, you can actually feed yourself. And the guy goes, dude, you are a fucking asshole. You know that? <laughs> that is my life on social media. That's that's my life every day on social media, because when I don't just give somebody this entitled asshole an immediate answer, they say I'm the asshole. I'm like, bro, I'm I'm actually it's like you going, just give me a cake, dude. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> actually, here's the flour and the eggs and the milk and the vanilla extract and all the stuff. And dude, I'm gonna teach you. So if you want a cake every day, like you can make this, you can make a cake every day. You don't have to ask me for fuck cake. And dude goes, man, you are a fucking asshole. That's what I get every day back and forth. So I'm like, dude, I'm giving you this information, but I can't individualize it just for you. But what I'm going to give you all the ingredients. So if you want to make a chocolate cake, you could make you a chocolate cake. And if you want to make a vanilla cake, you can make a, if you want to make a strawberry cake. You want to make a red velvet cake. You want to make Oreo cake. But I'm going to teach you how to do that part to make cake. And I'm giving you the best part. The guy goes, no, dude, just give me a cake. I'm like, dude, I don't, that's not, I'm not, can't show up every day to give you a cake. <laughs> All depends on how much he's willing to pay you, man. Right. Well, I mean, it's well, no one's willing to pay anything. They just, they just want. Well, that's the problem. Like I said, they but do my problem with this is this is that most of these guys are what I call assholes and that's they they don't really want the answer because here's the thing how many things can that you need to answer for can you just get on google for right so like i get people ask me what's a meso cycle I'm like just google it man you'll find out about a macro cycle a micro cycle and a meso cycle right there if you google it and you know what happened you have some knowledge cuz now you'll have knowledge is about micro cycles which is just what you're doing in a daily training session or a macro cycle, which is months and months of a training cycle or a year long cycle. So you now have some other knowledge that you obtained and built your knowledge base that if I just answered what's a meso cycle, then you just know that answer. But if you actually go and research it, and that's the way that my mind works. So somebody asked one day, like how I ended up with so much knowledge and that's, I would hear something I didn't know the answer to. And I was like, what is that? And I didn't ask that person. I would go read about it. And then while I'm reading about it, I would read something in there because what the fuck does that mean? And then I would go read about what the fuck that means. And then I would read something in there and I go, what the fuck does that mean? And then I would go read and then I would end up circling back. And when I would read the first thing, a whole bunch of shit would make so much sense. Much more sense right. Yeah. And I'm like, that is how you basically do self-education is like is you have to be in a lot of what the fuck does that mean like moments you have to have those but you got to be willing to have those and so many guys online the reason why i think that they have so much confusion is because number one they don't want to say what the fuck does that mean and go research it and then go let me go apply this let me go apply this so i can find out what's the outcome when i do this so when i do this um i'm like or some sometimes a methodology you do it and you go i don't really like that and i still think there's something to be said for just enjoying your training right because there's something like you know i'm good friends with uh Kasim, and me and Kasim, Kasim would be like this is a great exercise i'm like i fucking hate that exercise it doesn't mean that he can't explain it in a way that say it's not good biomechanically but i'm like dude i don't fucking like it and you know like he will still laugh about it he'll try to I'm like, you cannot convince me to like that shit i don't like it i don't like how it feels how it does fit and, he, and I've, we've been together and he's like, let me line it up. And I'm like, bro, it's, I don't like it. I don't like it. There's still movements, certain movements I don't like. And I just don't like them. And I say, I've been training for 30 something years. I know when I don't like a movement. I don't, and I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm saying, I don't like it. Right. That's the first preference. That, cake, that yeah. comes back to the cake thing. Like if somebody sits down and they give you carrot cake and you go, I don't like it. 
It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the way they made the carrot cake. It just means you don't like it. So um, a lot of these guys don't want to go in. They would actually find out that certain methodologies, maybe that they, they do them. And they're like, well, I did that and I enjoyed it, but I just, it just wasn't result producing. That can be a case too. Or that I did that um, and I didn't enjoy doing that. And maybe I would have gotten more results out of it because there's definitely, I think there's also something to be said for training really hard, maybe not even doing all the right stuff. Kind of like we're talking about barbell movements and shit. Maybe you're not doing a, a really laid out well training program, but you're fucking busting ass and you get some results. And there's, I think there's something to be said for just having a high degree of effort. And even if you're doing wrong stuff, you're going to get, you're going to get some outcome. You maybe get some negative outcomes too, but you're probably going to get some positive outcomes just from going in and training really hard. Even if you're choosing some maybe not so optimal movements or even some bad ones, you'll end up, but those will teach you stuff too. You're like, I did those for a while. And man, I ended up, with, you know, a lot of the chicks over the, the last couple of years, I've told them, you got to quit doing all this, you know, hip flexion plus abduction stuff. And I'm like, because that's going to eventually lead to some sciatic pain uh, because you're just constantly, you know, stressing that piriformis and that abduction, and then ends up pushing up against a sciatic nerve. And then they're like, oh, now I know why I had so much sciatic pain during that time. So, but that's also something, so I don't know why that never hits them. They're like, wow, I'm doing 72 monster walks a week on top of the abduction machine. Um, and then I'm lying down doing clamshells and doing all the shit. I'm like fucking back pain, sciatic nerve pain, like all the time. I'm like, I don't know, man, what movement pattern do you think that you're doing a lot of right now? So, but that's the other thing. I don't think a lot of people these days have a lot of critical thinking either. Well, no I don't think people do a lot of critical thinking. Well, a lot of people on his post, they'll say like, he'll say, he'll say, this is a more optimal way to set this up. Mm -hmm. And someone will invariably get in the comments and be like, well, what about, I got all these Jack guys at the gym that do this. Like, well, I'm not saying that that shit doesn't work. Like you said, apply a high degree of effort over time. Something is going to happen. You could get New York to Miami doing nothing but left turns, but I guarantee you there's a better way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the ones I always use. I'm like, you can, yeah, you can get from Los Angeles uh, to New York on like a bicycle, but there's probably a more efficient way to get it out. Will we? And that's one of the ones I come up with. It's like, I see a bunch of, how do you reconcile a bunch of jack dudes in the gym that are doing all the stuff you say you have to do? I'm like, I don't reconcile it at all. Like, if a guy is going in and doing cheat curls for 10 years really heavy, are you like, am I supposed to tell you he's not going to grow some biceps from that? He fucking will. But is there probably a better way? My biggest thing is, can we get you there? Um, like for whatever your genetic potential is, can we get you there in a way that's both more fun and pain-free? And that's kind of my, 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 my point about all that is that the, is there, to me, efficiency means that I'm getting the maximal amount of results pain-free. Mm -hmm. So that's what efficiency is, right? So it's kind of like to draw the fighting analogy there is that um if you're a fighter getting hit like getting hit in the face as less as possible is way more idea than just having a good chin so it's like if you don't if you don't have to get if you become a good enough fighter and develop a skill where you don't actually you don't eat the other guy's fists with your face over and over again you could you're probably going to be a better fighter if you're not getting your face smashed in every fight if you say, man, but I can take a punch, but bro, but you don't have, to, if you just, if you learn some head movement and you don't stand up like a fucking statue and just eat like, you know, straight right after straight, right after straight, right. And dudes, but I can take it, man, but you don't have to take it, bro. Like we can teach you how to get some head movement, how to, you know, like you don't have to, you can actually teach you how to block a fucking punch, you know, and he's like, no, nah, man, I'll just wade through that shit. And I'm like, dude, there's a better way. Like, dude, that's what I feel like I did with the line. And they're like, no, man, I'm just going to bench press fucking elbows wide and fucking, <laughs> shit and fucking brown back cat shit in the box deadlifts. And <laughs> like, all right, man, if that's, if that's the route you want to take, I can't stop it. I can't stop it. <laughs> I'm just trying to teach you a better way. That's the, They're the same fucking dudes. They're the same fucking dudes. That dude is just going to wade through the punches and Fuck. eat fist after fist after straight right after straight right. And he goes, but I got the chin for it. I can take it. 
is the same dude that just wants to do deadlifts that looks like a cat taking a shit in a box and thinks that's the way to build back. It's the same fucking dude. If that dude gives up lifting. He's going to be the same dude that eats straight rights every fight he's in. Well, those are the type of guys that, that oh, keep you in business, God. right? Because because they're the ones that inevitably, oh, they definitely keep oh, contracting like in business, are, right? Those are <laughs> the guys that like keep me in business are actually the guys that listen, were that guy that were. evolved I mean, out of being that guy. Because <laughs> now, because he's the fighter, now he's the fighter that used to eat straight right after straight right. And he's like, bro, I could have fought for 10 more years <laughs> if I didn't just learn some head movement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, AKA, hey, look at Floyd Mayweather. Guy doesn't yeah, get hit. Well, like you couldn't hit him, right? Right. right. So he him. fought, he's like, well, he's been fighting 70 years now. And <laughs> He's like, that's the point. Like, that's your longevity. And that's like such a great, like, you know, uh, parallel. It's like, so somebody like Floyd could fight for 20 years yeah. because he you just can't, he just doesn't take anything. He doesn't get hit. Yeah. So he, I mean, he doesn't say, punch back hard, but he, but he doesn't get hit. <laughs> that's all it is. He doesn't get hit, right? Like, yeah, he, he just doesn't him. get hit. That's all it is. Yeah. But it doesn't even circle back around that. But that was why even, even back then, I don't think people will probably appreciate for a long time when Connor was in his prime. That he oh. could go transition from MMA and go ten rounds With before he got members. knocked out. But the probably Floyd would go down as one of the top three boxers of all time. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? I'm not People even a Floyd fan. Him, whatever, dude. But he'll go down as one of the top three boxers of all time. Um, and Conor went ten rounds with him. Right. Because any, like round. I remember thinking at the time, I was like, dude, if he gets to the fifth round, he's fucking amazing. <laughs> Like, and there's some dude, there's some dude mm -hmm. sitting at home on his couch that would strain his gut, getting yeah. to his fridge for that next beer that's that talks shit on those kind of guys. That's yep. what I remember growing up. Like, I have friends, friends with a lot. I was friends with a lot of MMA fighters, NFL players and stuff. And, you know, we would always talk about that. I'm friends with, uh, really good friends with John Wellborn, who was, um, I don't know if you guys follow, like, football. But John played for the, he was a starting guard for the Eagles for, I think six years and then for the Chiefs for like five or six. And uh, John and I are really close. Uh, I love him like a brother. You know, he's like, he can't go anywhere. It's like hearing those fucking some guy talking about his high school football bullshit. Like I played semi-pro out in Texas after two years. And I won't even talk about football around John because he was 11 year NFL better. Uh, you want to hear some fucking story. I'm like the only guy that can get him to talk about his NFL stories. But it's the same guy like talking about there's some guy at home that's talking shit online about some dude that's like like uh like fifth on the depth chart at wide receiver on the nfl team about how that guy sucks like that guy can't even go out and play on the yard with his kids <laughs> right <laughs> legit dude mma it, that's what mma is now it's what mma and lifting is now dude i get a troll every day that that dms me um to tell me i ain't shit <laughs> fucking Let's see. It's always a combination of I ain't shit and I got 14 inch arms and I'm all soft stuff. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Here's the thing, man. You don't get both of them. Which one is it? Either I'm really tiny and small and I got I ain't shit. And I got 14 inch arms, or I'm soft stuff and I'm really fucking jacked. You don't get both. You don't get disparage me both ways. Like pick you pick one of your shit talking sides. Like, am I really jacked? And that's why you're saying I'm all soft stuff. Is that it? Because if you if I'm only really jacked because I'm super soft up, just say that and I'll take that insult. But you don't get to say I got 14 inch arms and I ain't shit, and then turn around and say you only look like that because you're all soft up. I'm like, which one, man? Come on, dude, just pick a side and insult me from that side. Tell me I ain't shit all day and I got 14 inch arms, but just stick to that side, you know, like just go with that. So Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, uh, internet trolls are, are going to be around for a long, long time. Let's just put it that way. As long that's, as the internet's going to be, yeah, there. this is this is where this industry is going to go. I, I, I have days now where I feel like I need to take more time off of social. I don't know if you guys feel like that uh, the social media landscape has become more volatile the yeah. past few years, or if it's just me. I remember at a time I felt like Instagram used to be actually more friendly than Facebook. Oh yeah. Instagram was fun. So it's, it's, it was like, do you guys not? Do you guys feel that way? Like, I feel like Instagram is hostile as fuck. Well, it's it's the most popular way to meet, to communicate on social media at this point, right? Because you have picture stories and and you could DM people directly, right? So it's it's the most uh, you have the most access to people on this one that's owned by Facebook, right? So right. 
and 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 you, there's no age limit on Instagram <laughs> at this point. Well, they're supposed to be, but no one does it. They all lie about it, right? So the fact of the matter is that that this 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 day and age, these these kids now, they're they're so tech savvy and so smart. Like I'll use my 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 oldest daughter's like one of the top schools in, in, in the country, and she's and she's only 14, but her mouth, I tell her all the time, I'm like, listen, you're so smart. Someone's going to punch you in the face one day. And you can't talk anymore. And then, then what are you <laughs> going to do? Because of how smart she, she's too smart for herself. I'm right. like, you have no experience. The problem is these guys have no experience in life. You know, again, when we talk about we used to go up to each other and say these things and take the consequence. No right. one understands the consequences and the social media has just made it easier because it's like, listen, man, I'm a, I'm a this is a freedom of speech. Hmm. It's crap. <laughs> it's crap. You have no freedom of speech because you have no experience. It's one thing if a veteran was talking about certain things. It's it's totally different if you're if you're 14, 15, 18, 20 years old, never done anything in your life. It's very different. And and for mm-hmm. some reason we we there's no policing it at this point. And this is why a lot of and I see it a lot of kids go through depression now, right? A lot I've seen a lot of kids have to go through that's why therapy is huge now, right? I think therapy has gotten bigger and bigger. I was like, go outside, get off the computer, you know. You don't, your therapy should be physical activity at this point. You should be doing something um, rather than just looking at a computer. Yeah, we live. Um, I remember reading some study a while back. It was like we're our kids are on more antidepressants and um, different types of medications and stuff like that now, like more than like a clearly in the history uh, of mankind. I think a huge part of it is we're, we actually live in the, the greatest degree of prosperity um, of any generation either. And so when you kind of look at that is like prosperity does not end up giving, always giving you a happy life. It's all about your, your perception. And I think the reason why a lot of, um, we have a lot of depression, especially like in the younger is because it's this constant um, need to feel like that they're, they measure up or as good as this other person they see um, and things like that. And you had mentioned earlier, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, like depression that we go through as men, like literally circling all the way back around to the early conversations of this, it's like um, after after I went through um, after I went through my divorce and all that kind of stuff, I went through a long period. I went through a, a pretty severe depression um, I, after that for a while, um, and I definitely didn't. I knew it was because I just felt like I had failed myself and my kids and people I loved in life. I never saw that as a quote unquote uh, midlife crisis. But they actually brought up the Corvette earlier. We were talking about life crisis. They were talking about. He said, "I haven't not got a Corvette yet." Um, so I, it's like she didn't. She didn't know like the whole Corvette thing from life crisis. But getting back to, um, getting back to yeah, that is like the, the whole depression thing. Was I think there is definitely a real um, kind of like resurrection and rebirthing of yourself as a man in your late thirties and early forties. And I want to say that that particular, the reason why you hear about depression in men about that is a multitude of reasons. And one of them, I think, is inability to emote properly, to express emotions, feelings um, due to potential fear of weakness or how you grew up. I don't know what you guys had in terms of like uh, father figure role models or moms or stuff like that. I was very fortunate that I grew up in a home um, where it was okay to express how you felt. Uh, my dad was really loving, hug me and tell me, love me, uh, you know, and, you know, kiss me. And my mom was the same way. So I grew up in a home. And I think the reason why I'm able to connect with a lot of men on those levels is because maybe they grew up in homes where they had fathers who were detached from helping them to express those emotions properly or, um, you know, being able to sit down. You know, a lot of guys I talked to over the years are like, man, I just wish my dad would have, have ever hugged me or told me he was proud of me or. Um, some of the stuff that guys go through because our our fathers didn't necessarily grow up in a generation where they were taught that that was okay, right? And so I think a lot of times we go through depressions because number one, we don't always feel like it's okay to connect with other men um, and express, you know, kind of the stuff that you were talking about earlier that I'm struggling with. Man, that's such a strong and resilient, um, there's such a strength and vulnerability, right? I really believe that. I think that one of the strongest things we can do as men is to have a sense of vulnerability about either the things that we're struggling with so that it's okay to be wrong, that we don't have to be right all the time. 
um, that we don't have all the answers, um, that we made mistakes, uh, that we that we're going through a period right now where we're having an internal struggle, uh, almost like feels like an identity crisis, or that we're having a lot of grief over um, decisions or that we've made in this life, people that we've wronged or betrayals that we've committed. There's a multitude of heavy burdens that we can carry around. Um, that we have to learn how to, to let go of, uh, open our hand up and let that broken glass out of it rather than holding on to it and allow it to continue to cut us deeply. So um, from like, you know, kids going through the depression, constantly comparing themselves um, to what they see that other kids have or getting, you know, bullied online and that kind of stuff to us trying to find that real maturation process as men where we start to hit our early 40s. And we do realize, man, I, I, I've lost that on years, um, behaving in ways I don't feel like are honorable or becoming um, as the person I want to be. Um, you know, the multitude of areas that I still didn't grow in. Um, I would feel fortunate uh, that you know, like me and Danielle talk about our faith a lot every day. Um, I still could I cuss a lot. She just told me like today. She's like, I want to stop cussing as much. I've never said a word about her cussing. Um, I feel like that that's something that God put on, right? Like by her cussing, God's never convicted me about my cussing. I don't, I don't say there's certain words, but like, um, that's one thing that I don't, I've never felt convicted about. It's like my cussing, but if she stops, I think what will happen is God will be like, you see the examples that she set for you? It's like, that's, you need to, you need to step up too. Cause I already started feeling that today. I'm like, no, I want you to cuss some more. But anyway, getting back to that was, um, that I think that, um, that's the, that's really the process that we go through. That's why I don't necessarily like to sit back and potentially call it a midlife crisis rather than a, um, I'm gonna have to come up with a phrase for it because that I feel like that often has such a negative connotation um, to it. And I think that for, that some men, maybe they do go through a midlife crisis where they all of a sudden they wake up one day and they realize, you know, they come to face to face with a sense of mortality. But I, I did, that was never the case for me. I don't think about that stuff ever. It was just a case for me where I, I didn't like waking up to the man that I, I was each day and I wanted to grow into someone so much better. Um, and I think that you can have a quote unquote life crisis or a man crisis about that kind of stuff uh, to where you wake up each day and you say, man, there's this whole better version of me that I know that I'm missing out on that I want to grow into. And there's this whole old version of me. I really just want to leave behind. that has all of these um, characteristics and attributes and, behavioral traits that I don't like about myself. Anymore. And I think when we're sitting in that particular space, right, it's like the evolution of going from that space of I am this person and I'm, I have these repeated behavior patterns and these things I do. And then when I do them, I feel really awful inside and I carry that around for a few days and I've said things and I've done things and I've behaved and reacted in ways that are just unbecoming um, as a man. And I just want to be so much better. And then the chasm that exists between those two is like when we get caught in here, I think that's a lot of what we're going through is like, we're in this space here where we feel those terrible ways about who we are. Then we start navigating through that chasm where we're still kind of taking those remnants of that old person, but we're slowly letting go of them and we're trying to step into this new person. And it's really hard. Sometimes we fall back into those old patterns and we have that depression of doing that and feeling like we let ourselves down, like we let people we love down, that we say things in a way that were like, man, I, I can't take that back. You know, I, I wish I would have said that. I wish I would have had better emotional control in those moments. Um, and then trying to get over to this other side of where we see in our head, here's all these circumstances that came through in our life. And we say, I wish I would handle it this way better and that way better and that way better. Right. And then we're doing the work. And then I think what that quote unquote midlife crisis is or that sense of depression is, is that crossover from this old person that existed inside this shell that I was really, I had pain. I don't know if you guys ever saw this, this rabbi was talking about this. So lobsters outgrow their shells so many times in life. I can't remember how many times it is in their life. And each time that the lobster needs to grow into a larger shell, he'll go and hide. And he will basically get rid of that old shell. He will grow a new shell that's larger so he can fit inside that because the old shell becomes uncomfortable. Because his body underneath it, inside that shell is growing. The shell becomes uncomfortable for him to stay in. <clears throat> and I think we have a similar evolution in our life where we go from where we're existing inside of these behavioral traits and these stories that we tell ourselves and these things that we've learned 
and we're repeating that existing in that space and then we start to have a certain amount of self-awareness wow i'm really existing in this space right now and i don't want to anymore maybe we're, we haven't developed all of the different mechanisms that work for us or maybe we have found the tools that work for us but we know it's there and we're struggling to get through that but that's the chasm that exists between that space of living um and the person that we know we don't want to be anymore and the person that we're trying to grow into and i think what that quote unquote midlife crisis is that depression is that that chasm that exists that deep valley that we go through and then we get to come out on the other side and it's not that we're ever this com i feel like this can necessarily complete person but we have enough self-awareness that we've at least grown out of be the person that we used to be that left us waking up each day feeling very unfulfilled uh, and feeling this overarching sense of sadness about our existence and lack of meaning every day in this life. That's, uh, you know, just the, what you explained right there literally brought me back to a couple of weeks ago. I had dinner. I had dinner with, with friends of mine that I, uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen in, in a couple of years, maybe because post COVID, whatever. They've been my best, four of my best friends since high school. Right, so we're going over 25 years that, I, I, that I've been these closest guys. Back in the day, they went to clubs together, did all the fun stuff, all the, all the trouble we went through. Um, always had the jokes. They had everything from the gay jokes to the humility, you know, all the, all the fun stuff that we used to do back in the day, right? We're sitting at dinner, and they still got the jokes going, right? And I'm sitting there going, man, we're 42 years old, and we're still talking like this. And I was just like, this is why I can only stand, I, I can't stand more than four or five hours with you guys. Mm -hmm. Cause you haven't evolved yet. <laughs> I go, right. why is it that our conversation still is on the same topic from 20 years ago about you boning him? I'm like, why are we still on this, <laughs> this whole thing? Now I, I get it. It's funny at first, you know, first five minutes. Oh, ha, ha, we got back together again. Like what's happening with our life? You know, we all have kids. Why don't we talk about that stuff? It's just weird to me. I'm like, wow, this is one of those things because I even tried to talk to them because they, they they were my closest friends. They haven't listened to this podcast. I don't listen to my own podcast. It's weird, whatever. <laughs> but they don't listen to the podcast. They know I have it. And I was just like, why don't you just, just listen to it? Because you guys are part of it. You know, there, there's things that you guys should know about. And, they, and it was just a joke about the podcast. Well, I'm like, wow, you're really insulting me. We're supposed to be best friends, man. I'm like, no, I'm being serious. This is what I went through in my head. You guys weren't there. What what what's happening? Like, and it just kept going back to the same joke. I'm like, wow, this is again, this is why I can't stand more than five hours with you guys. <laughs> I'm like, you didn't evolve. Why are we still friends? <laughs> you know, and and to your point, another thing is in that time frame, right? Where I felt like, wow, early 30s, 40s now. I'm like, what what have I accomplished? Like, I feel like I really, as much as as an impact. I'm, I'm like a big fish in a small pond. I feel like our names travel pretty strong in this area for fitness, but it's also like, what have we, what have I really accomplished in fitness at this point? Like, yeah, I could walk into any gym uh, and I could get a job. Like I could literally walk into anywhere and, and pick a job wherever I want. But it's like, I really feel like I haven't accomplished much. Right. And I feel like there has, there's still more for me. Right. But I also feel like we're closer to 50 than we are 20. <laughs> you know, and, and that sure. and that's a, like a weird thing for me. And that's just me. I feel like that's just a weird thing for me to think about the numbers. Like you said, you know, it's like, it, it, I feel like did, I lost something. And that's where it started for me to understand it. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I've gotten out of a lot of it, right? And I think this has obviously helped me. Um, someone like Dave has always helped me because he's yeah. been around for so long. But um, it, it's still one of those things where, I don't want to say I struggle. I do question things still. I'm like, oh, I felt weird again. What am I supposed to feel like this? Is something going wrong with me? And again, I look at my kids, the the classmates' parents, and I'm like, man, like you, you still like. <laughs> I was like, why am I around these people? Type of type of thing. And I I don't know that, that that's just my thought process as you were speaking on that. That's exactly how I felt about a lot of things, you know. And, and the things I that think I've that, but, but I also think there's a moment there that you should have, there should have been an aha moment there too, is, is that, um, you, you know, you said earlier, you know, like you, you feel like you're struggling with some aspects and stuff in your life, but then when you get around other people that are still behaving in a way, you clearly 
the, the aha moment you should have there is you're like, wow, there has been some growth there. There has been some personal development there. There has been some things in my life that has started to transcend because I can't be around you very long anymore. We used to be, we used to be bros, man. We used to, we used to be partners. We used to be brothers. And I like, now I'm sitting here and as you talk, I'm like, you get that weird feeling when you're, and I, I know what you're talking about. When you're around people, they used to be, and you sit and talk with them and you're like, bro, why do you still talk this way? Yeah. And you're like, why do you still, I, why is why they have an energy that's really off putting to you now. Yeah. And you're like, did I used to really sit in these spaces with you? Yeah. And you yearn for that, man. I just want a deeper connection, even with your, whether it's with your boys or with your, the lady you're exactly. with or whatever. You're like, I just want that deeper connection. I want to be able to sit and have those, those good conversations, those soul endearing conversations. Um, and then whether you have that with your, with your friends or you have that with certain family or whether you have that with your partner or whatever, the huge part there is that you say, well, I'm struggling going through stuff. I'm like, man, you're, you're doing the transcending now because you're already in the place where you're like, when you're around that old environment, you're like, wow, that's really gross, man. I don't want to be around that. Cause I need to, I can't handle you now for more than a few minutes. And I'm like, why are you talking like that? Like we don't, bro, we're supposed to be much better people than that. Like right. I catch myself. It's a pretty cool thing. I'll catch myself um, even in situations now where I will see people and my old self when I, you don't realize how dysfunctional you are until you get far enough away. And I'll see like, for example, I'll see an overweight person. I like, I remember I used to be so judgmental about that. I think nothing now, like I don't think any negative or whatever um, about that kind of stuff. I do tell people it's like, Hey, take care of yourself. Here's why. So, forth, so on. but I used to have those internal like dialogue thoughts where I would see like, really overweight people and i would think really or say really derogative stuff like that never even enters my mind now and that might not sound like much but i think one of the the best emotional temperature checks that we can give ourselves is what's our internal dialogue doing about people around us how do we you know christ talked about that we just had that that conversation the other day and christ talked about said uh, the fact that any man that lusts after another woman in his mind already could right. committed adultery in, in his heart um and whether you're a christian or not is irrelevant i always think about that what is your heart temperature check in in those moments right um if you've got a woman that you love one of the things me and danielle i asked her like weeks ago i said when you're with me have you ever even caught me looking at other have you ever even for a minute seen me look at another woman she goes no and i always tell guys that i was like if if you have a woman in your life always make her feel the most love where's your heart at like, um, I don't yearn for that, like that stuff anymore. Grew out of that, grew away from that. I went through like the whole thing a lot of guys go through. Um, I always feel fortunate that uh, I have a partner that'll get through tough times with me, that will make me feel loved, um, that will do those things. That's, that stuff is like, it's so hard to find um, today in, in this world. And um, in those moments, I always tell, where's your heart at? do that temperature check internally of what your internal dialogue is doing, because we can all say the best things or write stuff online or whatever. Well, where's our internal dialogue at in moments? How do we talk about ourselves? How do we talk about other people? Even the parts that aren't coming out of our mouth. So right there, even in those moments when you're sitting with your boys, you're having that internal dialogue with yourself where you're going like, what is, wow, what the hell is this shit? Like, how am I even how are these my dudes? Like how, and how did they not grow up past like this stage that we were in 15 years ago where I'm struggling every day, waking up being like, man, I just want so much more for me as a man. I want so much more for my life. I want to be able to give more. I want to be able to love better. I want to be able to have better emotional control. I want to be able to, there's so many things in my life I want to step into and I'm struggling right now. But then you sit in that conversation and just to give you a, hey, bro, you're getting there moment. When you sit in those old conversations like that and you feel that, oh, that's really gross. That's growth, man. That's gross. So you're, it's happening. It's just you're in that, you're basically in that, that crevice between those two places right now. And that's the hardest place to be. And I remember going through that. And I remember so many struggles and so many times where I would 
end up repeating the old bad habits and that can happen. So just hang in there, man. Like you'll get there as long as you're desiring that and you seek it out, get up every day, find something on personal development that you can read that you feel like will help you look into those different things. I think that's a wonderful thing to hear you say, because um, anytime a guy starts talking like that, I know he's really, he's going to grow, man. He's going to get out of those old places and he's going to get into a new, better version of himself. And that's where he's headed. But this, this time, where you're in that particular, that really painful growth phase. It's like being 14 years old and finding out that you can have an orgasm and your knees hurt because you're growing too fast <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And you take four showers a day because you're masturbating all the time. <laughs> and all of your life feels fucking weird. And Wait, that's know, not now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's well, my, oh, no, my, knees, my, knees, my knees don't hurt. So... <laughs> But I mean, that's essentially like where you're at now with that part. It's like, but it's the emotional, it's the, the internal part uh, and it's the maturation into that. And all that stuff is super painful. All of that stuff is super painful because it's the constant internal questioning of the person that you are, or are you good enough? And it's not even about comparing yourself to other people. It's, am I a good enough person for me? That's a good one. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, you all right? Yeah, no, I'm good. All right. I'm good. I, you, I you get to go through this every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do it. Yeah, I know. That's, that's why we started this, right? It's all for me, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do you guys have anything else? No, I think that was, that was, I yeah, mean, yeah, we're actually reaching our time here. I don't think um, anything's going to top everybody knows said, Paul yeah. from all his stuff on Instagram and hypertrophy stuff, but yeah, yeah so wait, so why don't you, uh, we, we do have to close up. Uh, just real quick, Paul, if you, if you could just, Tell everyone that, that watches this how they, you know, what you have going on, if, if you have anything that you're releasing soon or where they can find you more of your articles and stuff like that, you know, it'd be great. Well, seeing how social media keep de keeps deactivating my account for various reasons. Do they really? Yeah. Just, yeah, just like, if you just Google Paul Carter, you'll find me somewhere. I actually feel like I, I, I'm going to have to at least redo my entire website uh, this year at some point and maybe just start posting my content on my website, group my website out. Um, because I can't, I can't, um, I can't cancel myself. Um, right. And, you know, um, I, I literally, my, my, uh, old account, call it my old account, uh, was deactivated last week. I think I had 108,000 followers on there, um, uh, simply for stating in a Q and A, the reasons that I wasn't going to get the vaccination. Wow. And I can't DM right now. So but I can't respond to DMs. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Wow. So wait, yeah, so yeah. Do, wait, do you have a website currently that you, you are going to redo? Just my old blog. And I haven't, I haven't put anything out there um, in years. Um, but the guys over at Training World told me they'll re overhaul my entire website, which is probably not a bad idea, which is, is um, to let them do it. I really think you but should. The people, I mean, do people even use websites anymore? Yeah, yeah, for content, a lot more content. People uh, just for information. It's no interaction. It's not. It's not a big thing for interaction, right. but it's it's more for for the content purposes, and, and people can't interact on them. But it's just, I think, for your content purposes, of articles and stuff like that, you should definitely keep that up uh, because they can't censor it. Yeah, they're, they're, what are they going to say? You're, I mean, it's your site. <laughs> right. What are you going to do? About um, it? The other one is um, is I I probably and this was what John was trying to talk me into before he passed was. Getting my you getting a YouTube up and going. That was the next thing I was gonna say. You, you and, go uh, live on that one. Yeah, I've been doing I've been doing lives in the morning just for fun. Uh, I do enjoy roasting people that come into my lives, but my following is pretty good about it now because uh, um, the one thing I think that will happen over time is that your people, your tribe, will gravitate towards you and the way that you are, and they won't either be offended by you or they'll share a similar attitude and interest as you. Right. And so like in the morning, sometimes when I get on, I'll be doing my live and I'll tell people, um, I'm like, here's the topic I'm going to talk about for today. And then, and then there'll always be some donkeys that come in there <laughs> that, that try to ask me a bunch of stupid off topic questions. And then I don't always even have to say anything to other people in there. Be like, will you guys shut the fuck up? <laughs> it's pretty cool. So I've gotten to that point where that's the case. So, I, I mean, I've grown up. I've had the second biggest, uh, as far as like advertising and stuff. I have the second biggest team on the entire Trans Heroic uh, platform. Um, I've, and that's a pretty big accomplishment because I've only been on that platform um, for uh, a little more than a year. And the guys who 
that has the biggest platform, bigger platform than I do has been on it for seven years. Um, and I passed up Cal Street and um, they've been on it for five years. So I basically took me a year to, to pass everybody up except for one person, which I'll pass up in the next couple of years. Um, his team is twice as big as mine. So it'll take, it'll take, it'll take me a hot minute. But um, uh, as far as like all the aspects of my life, I don't know that my life has been more put together um, ever at this, like this point. And that comes back to where we were talking about earlier. Um, like right now, you're about four years behind me. So don't be hard on yourself. When uh, I had it, when I got, I, I got me a, a Audi RS7 this year. And uh, that was oh. my dream car. Whenever uh, I divorced, um, and I'll give you this, and I have to hop off because I have to eat, but I'm going to give you this, I hope this will give you some hope. When I got divorced, uh, I was making $70,000 in debt. Um, my girls wouldn't talk to me. Only my youngest really appeared to like me, even a little bit. Um, and I walked into an Audi dealership, and the picture was still on my old Instagram. And they had an RS7 on the floor. And I took a picture of it, put it on my Instagram, and I said, in five years, I'm going to buy this car. And I bought that car this year. I'm totally debt-free, have an amazing relationship with all my girls. Uh, I have an amazing fiance. Every part of my life is pretty much about as perfect as it can be. But if you would have told me when I was going through those deep valleys during that time to the point where um, I almost wanted to kill myself, um, when my girls wouldn't talk to me, when I was overcome with debt, um, when I felt like the, probably I felt like such an Im immense failure as a man, as a father, uh, in that time as a husband, in every way, if you would have told me, just hang in there, um, you're going to get through this, you're going to grow into a much better, uh, just a top to bottom better person, you're going to have a, a thriving business, uh, you're going to buy your dream car, you're going to have a better relationship with God, you're going to have an, uh, an amazing woman in your life, you're, like, if you, like every part of your life is going to be better. You're going to have to do the work, but I promise you this valley that you're in is going to serve a tremendous amount of purposes for you to get there, to ascend to that precipice of where you want to be. Wow. That's awesome. Inspirational. So, and we'll take it from there. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, we're going to close out and basically thank you again for, for all the information. We thank you for the conversation. It was great. Probably one of our better ones. I'll be honest with you. I think we're going to push this one pretty good. We'll have it up in live probably by tomorrow morning um and we should be good so yeah. we're good all right absolutely thank man thank thanks for having me on guys i really appreciate it, it was a really really fun conversation we covered, that was good covered a, i like when we can cover a lot of different topics that's always fun to me love that too yeah, all right all right awesome. so say goodbye everyone thank you paul all right. good good night. Night. have a good weekend guys